I want to thank everyone being, for being here today to focus on the growing problem of lithium ion battery safety. This isn't a new issue for the CPSC or for many of the experts in this room, but it's an increasingly deadly and destructive one. In recent years, there's been a noticeable increase in micromobility battery fires. And in urban environments like New York City, it can be particularly deadly, quickly spreading through apartment buildings or multifamily households. Fires tied to e-bikes, scooters, powered by lithium-ion batteries have resulted in countless injuries and far too many deaths. CPSC staff has been working closely with officials in New York as well as other uh, places to investigate fires and get to the bottom of how and why they're occurring. Staff's also challenging industry and voluntary standards groups to incorporate safer designs and performance requirements into products and they've been working on looking at products and seeking to recall defective ones. In December, CPSC called on manufacturers e-bikes, e-scooters, and similar devices to comply with baseline voluntary safety standards or face possible enforcement action. We've also reached out to retailers to encourage them to review the products that they're selling and to only carry products that are compliant with those safety standards. And we urge the public to only use batteries and chargers that were approved for their specific device. You know, unfortunately, we're continuing to see micromobility battery fires and lithium ion batteries are being used in more and more consumer products. So we're all gonna have to work together to understand and address existing hazards and to work proactively to design safety into the next generation of products. And that's why this forum today is so important with key players in the room, all of whom will be uh, need to be involved in any solution going forward. We'll be hearing from members of the New York congressional delegation who are prioritizing this issue. We'll hear from the commissioner of the FDNY who has seen the impacts of these fires firsthand and been a leader in pushing for safety improvements. And we're gonna hear from researchers, standard developers, industry, and consumer advocates who are steeped in this work. I'm glad that you all step forward to share your experiences and perspectives with us. If we're gonna make progress, we must prioritize safety every step of the way. So thanks also to my three colleagues who are with me on the dais today. All of you have encouraged us to hold this forum and I appreciate your close involvement and I look forward to the conversations that we're gonna to have today. We're going to start out the day by showing recorded videos submitted by Senator Chuck Schumer, Senator Kirsten Gilderman, and Representative Richie Torres. So if you could please go ahead and play those videos. Hi, everyone. It's Senator Chuck Schumer, and I want to thank Chairman Hohen Sarek and Commissioners Boyle, Feldman, and Trumka for bringing everyone together to discuss lithium ion battery safety an issue affecting so many communities in New York and in around the country. I also want to recognize our great fire commissioner, Laura Cavanaugh, who's with you today. She's been a strong advocate for battery safety in New York City, and we're grateful for her and the FDNY for keeping New York safe. As we all know, e-bikes, scooters, and other micro-mobility devices are more popular than ever. Millions of Americans rely on them every day, commuters, delivery workers, small business, and more. But the rapid surge of these devices has outpaced safety measures, especially when it comes to their lithium ion batteries. Many bikes and e-scooters are powered by cheap Chinese made lithium ion batteries that are more prone to overheat and then explode, sometimes causing severe and sadly deadly fires. In New York, there have been over 400 fires caused by these devices in the last four years, resulting in over 300 injuries and 12 deaths. Too often, it's hardworking immigrant deliveristas and their families who are the victims. That's why I've worked with Senator Gillibrand and Congressman Richie Torres to introduce the Setting Consumer Standards for Lithium, Lithium Ion Batteries Act, which requires the Consumer Product Safety Commission to establish national safety standards for lithium ion batteries used in micromobility devices. Our legislation would be an important step towards preventing these devastating fires and protecting the lives of consumers, families, and our first responders nationwide. 
So I look forward to working with you all on lithium ion battery safety moving forward. And thanks again for holding this important discussion. Hi, I'm Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and I want to welcome you to Consumer Product Safety Commission Roundtable Discussion on Lithium Ion Battery Safety. This has been such an important issue in New York where malfunctioning lithium ion batteries used in e-bikes and other micromobility devices have led to a number of deadly fires. It is essential to make sure products containing lithium ion batteries like micromobility devices are safe. And I will keep fighting in Congress to address this concerning issue. Hello, I'm United States Congressman Richie Torres, proudly representing New York's 15th Congressional District in the Bronx. I want to thank the Consumer Product Safety Commission for the opportunity to speak with you about a rising public safety challenge facing communities across the country, especially my own. In New York City, the number of lithium iron battery fires has been on the rise from more than 30 in 2019 to more than 40 in 2020 to more than 100 in 2021 to more than 200 in 2022. The trend is simply too alarming to ignore. We must take proactive measures to mitigate the risk posed by lithium ion batteries and the e-mobility devices that contain those batteries. Earlier in the year, I introduced the Setting Consumer Standards for Lithium Ion Batteries Act. The legislation would require the Consumer Product Safety Commission to establish final consumer product safety standards for rechargeable lithium ion batteries employed in personal mobility devices like electric scooters and bikes. At a time when these batteries power so much of our lives, it is vitally important that government, regulatory bodies, and industry stakeholders come together with urgency to set rigorous and responsible safety standards that will save lives. I'm encouraged to see the Commission is actively looking to deepen its understanding of the issue, and it's investigating the adequacy of present voluntary standards and battery designs. And I hope through the legislative process, my bill can build on the extraordinary work as we explore possible solutions to the problem. There is nothing more important than the safety of the people we serve. And it's our responsibility to do everything we can to prevent the catastrophic fires that bring untold devastation to communities like mine. Thank you again to the Consumer Product Safety Commission and to everyone participating in the forum for the time and attention you've dedicated to this issue of fire safety. So I want to thank the members of Congress for sharing their thoughts and their continued interest in this matter. Uh, at this point in time, I think we're going to introduce our first panel. Uh, if the commissioner could come to the table, please. So we have Laura Kavanaugh, who's the commissioner for the fire department of the city of New York. And with her at the table is Daniel Flynn, chief fire, fire marshal. Welcome, Commissioner Kavanaugh, and thank you for being here. And please begin. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Chair Owen Sarek, and all the members of the commission. My name is Laura Kavanaugh, and I am the commissioner of the New York City Fire Department. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you the New York City Fire Department's experiences with fires involving lithium ion batteries and micro mobility devices. The New York City Fire Department has been carefully tracking the increase in fires caused by lithium ion batteries in micro mobility devices. These batteries are commonly found in e bikes, e scooters, and other devices such as electric skateboards and hoverboards. In New York City, the use of powered mobility devices multiplied dramatically during the pandemic. They have become ubiquitous among delivery workers, fueling around the clock convenience the consumers have come to rely upon. The upward trend of fires caused by lithium ion batteries has had truly devastating effects on New Yorkers. Whereas an injury stemming from a lithium ion battery was a relatively rare occurrence in 2019, when we saw only a total of 13 such injuries in New York City, by 2022, we experienced 147 of those same injuries. In 2023, we are far outpacing that number with 87 injuries to date. We have already experienced 13 deaths in these incidents this year. We have reached a point of crisis in New York City. Lithium ion batteries are now a top cause of fatal fires in New York. Lithium ion battery fires prevent 
present challenges to firefighters that are substantially different from other types of fires. In addition to what we might consider a traditional fire, these devices go into a process known as thermal runaway. This occurs when an excess of heat is generated within the battery, resulting in an uncontrollable self-heating status that can be safely dissipated. It causes a domino effect within the cells of the battery and creates a truly explosive state, producing an injection of gases, shrapnel, and particulates. Thermal runaway is evident by popping noises and billowing white smoke that is created. The smoke is toxic and highly flammable. A fire in a single lithium ion battery can easily spread to materials around it. If it is located near other lithium ion batteries, the process may re be repeated, increasing the intensity of that fire. Even when it is not the original cause, the presence of a lithium ion battery at a fire caused by another source makes fighting that fire significantly more dangerous. Many of the fires that we've experienced in New York City have been intense and high profile. In one incident, FDNY members responding to an e-bike fire in a Manhattan high-rise were forced to make a rope rescue of two individuals via a window on the 20th story of that building. In another, two teenagers escaped a lithium-ion battery fire by climbing out of a fourth-story window and shimmying down a drainage pipe. Unfortunately, a neighbor perished in that incident. One of the reasons that these fires are particularly dangerous for residents in apartments is that users tend to leave bikes or other devices by the door to charge. When a fire occurs, it often blocks their sole mean of exit and the sole means for the firefighters to get in to rescue them. Another challenging aspect of lithium ion battery fires is that the danger is not over when the fire is out. The battery is still essentially a box of chemicals and it is not unusual for it to reignite. Once these batteries are damaged or involved in a fire, they may reignite hours or even days after being initially extinguished. Even a thorough inspection may not predict if or when a battery re may reignite, something that we have seen time and time again. I was recently present at a bike repair shop during an inspection, and as members of HAZMAT removed the batteries, one burst suddenly into flames. Given the unique difficulty with suppressing this type of fire, we dispatch FDNY hazmat units to every lithium ion battery fire to ensure that the batteries are properly handled. Hazmat has pioneered a procedure to eliminate the threat of damaged batteries. However, as the numbers grow and we experience these fires with greater frequency, it has become a challenge to find ways to dispose of all of them. As more devices appear in our communities, the number of fire incidents has rapidly increased. Other cities across the country have been begun seeing these issues as well, and municipalities that are not yet experiencing this phenomenon may be facing similar incidents in the future. The department has observed several factors that contribute to these fires, and we've incorporated this knowledge into outreach pieces and our safety materials. We advise the public not to leave devices unintended while charging them, not to leave a charging device on a couch, a bed, or a pillow, to only use devices that are certified by a qualified testing laboratory, to keep batteries at room temperature and away from anything flammable, to only use the manufacturer's power cords or batteries that are associated with that specific device, and that if a battery overheats or the user notices a change in shape, color, and odor, leaking, or noises, to immediately cease using the device. Our challenge is to ensure the safety of the public and our members, while also recognizing that people depend on these devices for their livelihood and for critical transportation alternatives. Manufacturers and retailers have a responsibility to produce and sell safer products. Delivery app companies that encourage workers to use the devices longer and faster than they were ever intended bear responsibility as well. In New York, Mayor Adams and the City Council have implemented a series of new laws restricting the use and the sale of unregulated devices. As a city and as a department, we are attacking this problem at every level, from the Mayor's Charge Safe Ride Safe Action Plan to working with state and local representatives, members of Congress, as you saw, industry representatives, testing entities, and an ongoing dialogue and engagement with our partners here at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have developed and released new public service announcements and safety materials. We continue amplifying our outreach to the community. These efforts, we know, will be effective over time, but we also know that there are unsafe devices in the hands of our citizens right now, so we are doing everything we can to mitigate those potential dangers. It is absolutely paramount that devices themselves become safer, 
And that process will depend on many of the people who are here today, including members of the commission, elected officials, researchers, scientists, and engineers, as well as manufacturers and industry representatives. It is my hope that through collaboration with fire departments and events like today's hearing, the commission will continue developing expertise and will act to regulate these products and incentivize safer designs. I urge the commission to adopt a national standard and enforce against manufacturers that fall short of that standard. We've seen that this technology technology moves very quickly, so regulations need to be forward looking in order to keep pace. I encourage you to explore standardizing battery safety features, such as tamper proof casings and mechanisms that automatically shut off when a device is fully charged or becomes overheated. You have tools available that can make a Warning to manufacturers issuing recall mandates and seizing products at the border. We're trying. Here's the fire department. The still shows you. And testing and evaluation of existing battery. Department of Homeland Security's Science and Technology Directorate, and specifically to their laboratory located in New York City the National Urban Security Technology Laboratory, or New Steel. New Steel recently established a program to support the fire service and other emergency responders in better understanding the public safety impacts of lithium ion batteries and other new en energy advancements. New York representatives Nidia Velasquez and Richard Torres have introduced legislation to address different aspects of this issue. We have advocated for a holistic approach to this problem at all levels of government from regulations, standards, policy changes, enforcement actions, education and outreach, and further research and testing. We are also very pleased that we have found a willing and enthusiastic partner in the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I have exchanged ideas and suggestions with Chair Hon Sarek and members of the commission, and FDNY fire marshals have worked closely with the CPSC staff. We have had a great working relationship and we will continue sharing data and evidence from the fires that we are seeing in the field to help CPSC experts learn about these incidents and how these products function. I am deeply appreciative for the time and the attention that the commissioners have given to this issue. And I am grateful for all the other witnesses who are testifying today. Micromobility lithium ion battery fires have taken a deadly toll on New York City and they endanger the lives of the first responders who answer the call when they occur. These incidents present a growing danger to members of communities across the country. Working together, I am confident that we can solve this problem, improve the technology and the way people use it, and ultimately save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Much appreciated. Um, we're going to bring uh, now begin discussion with the other commissioners. Um, each commissioner is going to have 10 minutes for rounds of questions, multiple rounds of questions if necessary. So I'm going to start and just say, Commissioner Kavanaugh, thank you so much for being here and sharing your experience uh, with these fires and the ways you've been working to improve safety. You know, your department has been in the center of the crisis, and I really appreciate, as you mentioned, the collaboration with CPSC staff uh, as investigations to these tragic fires have been carried out. I also want to acknowledge the good work that CPSC field staff has been doing as well. And the agency recently commended a senior product safety investigator uh, for her efforts related to lithium ion battery investigations in North New York area. And her work and that of her colleagues couldn't have been done without the access and support you and others that FDNY have given to our investigators. And the information that they're gathering is critical to our efforts to identify defective products, uh, build a case for recalls, and supplement our knowledge as we're looking to work on safety standards. So again, I thank you for your support and welcome a strengthening of that relationship in order to advance safety. I also wanna recognize the letters that you wrote to me last summer and this winter, as you wrote to me in August, the most equitable solution would be for manufacturers to design their devices to be safer rather than simply relying upon customers and delivery workers to bear the burden of mitigating risk. So I heard you then and I, I hear you now. And we're going to be certainly talking to other panels about this, but you know, I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying about the needs for mandatory safety standards and electrical systems and e-mobility devices and for replacement batteries and chargers. Can you talk a bit about how a mandatory safety standard would improve the safety in the New York area? 
Yeah, I would like to speak to that briefly and also um, hand it over to our chief fire marshal. Um, but, you know, we are have seen in most of these deadly fires and certainly in many of them are caused that they are devices that don't have um, basic safety standards that we see in most other consumer products that are safe, whether or not they were implemented uh, by the CPSC. So, you know, things like tamper proof containers, um, things like automatic shutoffs, um, we are almost always seeing that one of those things is uh, missing in the investigations when we're looking at the fires um, that are most deadly. If Chief Flynn add to that. Uh, yeah, as the commissioner said, um, you know, a lot of these fires post fire, we are able to examine what is left of the product. Oftentimes, not much. Uh, and we've worked closely with your investigators who have been a tremendous asset to not only the CPSC, but uh, the fire department, I believe, uh, and on a national level as well to share what information we're able to gather uh, post fire from these products. Um, recently, uh, our mayor signed in a local law that takes effect in September, which will require all uh, of these devices that are sold within the city to be certified by uh, UL or a recognized national uh, testing laboratory. Uh, we think that's going to go a long way. Um, we we are encouraged by that and, and we feel that that will make a difference. Uh, a lot of these fires that uh, we have uh, are from substandard products, we believe. Uh, we're doing that research uh, along with your with your help. Um, we're sharing that data. We, we're identifying products. We're, we're trying to find products that uh, seem to be failing more often than others. Um, so, yeah, I think I think the standard that we put in place within within the city um if if uh implemented nationally i think would make a tremendous difference and also to stress uh this is not a new york city problem um you know i think it gets lost sometimes uh in talking to other fire departments um if, if you don't have it now you will have it uh in your cities so so recognize that it, if you coming uh so so get out ahead of it and, and understand the dangers of uh, some of these devices I may I'd like to add one thing to that, which is um, there are other consumer products that don't have these issues, everything from electric vehicles to um, the smartphones that we use. And while there's, uh, you know, different forms of regulation for those, one of the things that makes uh, us most able to make sure they're safe is we know who the manufacturers are. We know who we can hold accountable either legally, legislatively, or uh, via PR. And so, you know, those very, very rarely have these sort of incidents. Because these are coming, you know, they're much cheaper devices, they can be manufactured much more easily, um, and they're coming from all over the world. We don't have that ability to call up, you know, or even to know who most of these manufacturers are, let alone to call them up and work with them and put pressure on them to make their devices safer. When one of these bursts into flames, we often don't know where it came from, and there's no one that we can hold accountable. And so I think that makes these sorts of standards um, from your agency and from the federal perspective much more important um, in this realm of these devices um, where we don't have some of these other tools available that we do in other consumer products. No, I think it's a really important point. I think in other areas where you do have these large device manufacturers, you know who is doing it. They are large companies that are um, generally want to have a product that people are going to want to come back and buy especially when you have the secondary market of batteries and chargers where the products aren't even the original manufacturers. It's hard to track them down. It's hard for us to find them. And if they don't have a presence in the United States, it's hard to hold them accountable. And I was, uh, you know, you touched on this, but I think what we've been seeing on the e-commerce the e side of things has made it all the more difficult. And do you have any experience as to sort of where some of the, the WS have been failing or causing fires or coming from as whether or not those are the, the ones that I think you said, sort of the, the cheap ones that are coming into the country? So we keep incredibly um, detailed information about every fire. I think the most important thing to note is because we're responding after a fire, there's often significant damage that makes it even harder um, to know the type of device, the manufacturer, but our, our fire marshals do do extensive interviews and we've shared 
um, those with uh, your investigators. So we do know in some cases, you know, certain companies, certain types of devices that seem to be failing at much higher rates. And, it, you know, it does seem that those are, like, as I said before, they are in large part these, you know, secondhand resellers, um, you know, people saying even that they bought it online and they presumed that meant that it was safe and it in fact does not. Um, Chief Lynn, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, that that's absolutely uh, true. And you know, within New York City, uh, really our ability uh, lies with the brick and mortar stores uh, to to conduct enforcement. We don't we don't really have the ability uh, to to limit uh, what products are being shipped uh, to to consumers uh, within within the city line. Uh, we we do uh, a a robust uh, um, enforcement uh, with those brick and mortar stores. Uh, we've we've uh, conducted close to a thousand inspections at these locations, issued uh, over a thousand uh, violations and summonses at these locations for unsafe practices, many times related to electrical issues that that occur uh, with with the charging of these devices uh, and the um, modification and uh, repair uh, in in reckless manner uh, of these devices. So we're, we're very limited. Uh, in the city, um, as far as boots on the ground, we this is an all-inclusive effort uh, from the fire department, as well as other city agencies. We've developed several task force to address this issue. Uh, we we go out every day, not only to conduct enforcement, but education. Our fire safety education is out there every day, trying to uh, educate um, not just um, the people that use this in commercial for commercial practices, but people who just use it for recreation and commuting. Um, this is not just a uh, deliver delivery driver issue. Uh, we've had many fires uh, where people uh, use these just for recreational uh, issues. We've had, uh, unfortunately, we've had children die from these children that have charged them in their room. We stress the safety issues to to the uh, people that have these fires. Uh, don't let your children charge them alone in their room. Understand the danger. We had a fire uh, about a year ago where. Um, a child was charging it in his room. The the fa the father of the child actually heard the device fail. He, he could hear the fire and he had reacted immediately. And the fire was so intense that he was unable to get in there and save his child. Uh, that that's how fast these fires move. And you know these these this is new to us. It's not um these the speed that these these fires travel is is something we've seen traditionally in um, incendiary fires where uh, gasoline pours. Uh, where the fire moves very, very quickly. Uh, generally, our traditional fires start small and then become large. These fires are, are large from the start. So that, that creates unique challenges uh, to our firefighters as well as the residents in the, in the occupancies. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, noting my time, I'm going to turn to my fellow commissioners. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for organizing uh, today's hearing, and thank you in particular to Anna Layton on your staff for the heavy lift of uh, organizing all of this. Uh, and, and of course, thank you to all of our, our witnesses today on, on this panel and, and the ones to come for being here to share your thoughts and experience and, and expertise. Uh, the issue that we're here to learn about today, lithium ion battery safety, is a challenge CPSC has faced for some time now. Uh, and as we've heard and, and we'll hear from today's witnesses, this it's a complicated issue. It involves a hazard pattern that spans across a variety of product categories. Uh, and while we're seeing these fires manifest acutely in micro mobility devices, including e-bikes and hoverboards, uh, we know that the battery fires can occur uh, in, in other products as well. So while today's discussion will focus heavily on micro mobility, uh, as it should, it's imp important that we keep a broader view of other product categories to make sure that CPSC and our other federal partners stay ahead of the hazards. Uh, today's testimony and discussions will underscore what we already know intuitively, that uh, this is an issue that implicates not only product design and safety standards, which is CPSC's core area of focus, uh, but also supply chain integrity, counterfeit interdiction, uh, consumer outreach, uh, and education, among other uh, issues. So uh, effectively mitigating against this hazard involves not only CPSC, but a whole of government approach. And that's why I'm glad that we heard today from members of the, the Senate and the House. And I appreciate the interest from Senator Schumer and Gillibrand and, and Representative Torres. And I, I look forward to working with Congress and other stakeholders like the FDNY uh, as we work to address the hazard. So uh, uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh and, and, and uh, uh, Chief Flynn, thank you for being here. I, I, I want to uh, thank you for, for sharing your expertise. Uh, your department is at the forefront of the fight to improve safety. 
uh, and, and I appreciate not only the testimony that you've offered today, uh, but the work that you all do day in and day out to keep your community safe. Uh, so I, I want to start with the question that I think most Americans want to know. Are these batteries safe? I think that's a great question. Um, I would say right now, if you have one of these in your home, you don't know. And that's pretty scary. Um, to that end, and I agree, uh, are you comfortable with the status quo? And if not, what else do you want to see from CPSC? Should we proceed to a mandatory standard here? Um, we definitely believe we should proceed to a mandatory standard. I'd say that both based on the risk we have right now, the rate at which that risk has gone up, um, the rate at which we've seen manufacturers go around local laws and standards and regulations, um, and what appears to be rapidly evolving technology. And you noted that um, in your opening remarks, and I appreciate that because one of the things we really focused on um, is the fact that just this technology alone is evolving beyond the regulations. And so I believe we need to go above and beyond and much further today um, because we will probably have to meet back here again. I think even as we uh, regulate these, you know, this this technology is going to keep sort of pushing the boundary um, of some of these safety issues, but also that just generally we're moving towards the electrification of many of the devices and things we use. Um, and that's some of the work we're doing with the Department of Homeland Security is to try to look at that, those, you know, 5, 10, 15 year plans yeah. and understand what the other new technologies and what other types of electrification, while they may not present the danger these present today, uh, what they might present in the future. Sure. Okay. Um, to, to, to that end, in, in in a recent trip to Arizona, my staff and I learned about a, a lithium-ion battery in, in suburban Phoenix. Uh, the commission recently announced a recall of hoverboards that were manufactured by the Jetson Electric Bike Company uh, that involved two tragic deaths in Hellertown, Pennsylvania, uh, a 10-year-old girl and uh, her 15-year-old sister who died when a hoverboard ignited in their home. Um, so while you touched on this. While New York City features prominently in the discussion about lithium-ion battery safety, we know that these issues aren't limited just to, to New York. Rural Hellertown and suburban Phoenix uh, show that the diversity of geography uh, and, and circumstances under which these uh, uh, fires can occur do, in fact, vary. Um, so what advice can you offer other fire departments across the country that might not have the resources that FDNY has at, at its disposal? And, and in particular, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, your, your department dispatches hazmat teams to assist with battery disposal. I'm curious what lessons your hazmat team has learned that you can share and, and what advice you might have for smaller departments across the country on how to handle these fires safely. So it's a great point, and I think one of the things we'd like to reinforce most of all, but also we've uh, reached out to other departments, and I really want to give credit uh, to Chief Flynn and his team that they adopted this early and proactively, which is knowing that these fires are occurring and keeping the data on them. Um, as you've pointed out, we have found this to be an issue in other places, and to the extent that um, it's not seen as one. We often find that's just not that they're they're not keeping that data right now. Um, we do have uh, luckily much more resources than a lot of smaller departments. Um, and we are actually working with the National Fire Administrator to talk about some of that data sharing. And I think even the commission would say that the data we've shared has been helpful. You know, the type of data about, you know, who is producing the dangerous devices, what circumstances are producing them are critical for regulating them. So I think, you know, data is one of the, the key parts of this and certainly we're, you know, a leader on this and we're reaching out to other departments, but we're also asking them to reach out to us um, to see how our, not only our resources, but our early experience, you know, is so often true in New York where there's simply more people, right, and more density. We often see things happen first in New York, um, and we want to be able to get ahead of it before it's as acute of a problem elsewhere, but it certainly already is a problem. And that the same thing is true with hazmat. You know, we're a regional resource. Um, we were on the Hill yesterday talking to much of our congressional delegation, and that's one of the things we were reinforcing is that, you know, we are funded for a reason so that we can be an asset to other departments weren't as large. Um, and I certainly, as I mentioned in my testimony, one of the things I would flag that we need to work on together is the sheer quantity of these batteries that are being produced and shipped here um, presents a real problem for disposal at every level. Um, you know, the more there are, uh, the more dangerous they are collectively, and the more of, you know, these various types of uh, mitigation measures we need to have. And even we are finding that the amount of batteries we're finding, there's not enough places to put them. 
I appreciate that answer. Uh, and, and I want to end on a, a note of personal privilege. Uh, in June 2021, there was an apartment fire building in Hell's Kitchen at uh, West 50th and 9th Avenue, where my uncle Steve has lived since the late 70s. And uh, there was significant property damage. Uh, the fire spread across three floors. Uh, but property can be replaced. Uh, and thanks to the quick work of the FDNY, uh, the injuries were, were minor and there were no fatalities. So the professionalism of your department uh, and the bravery of your fire, uh, fighters is, is something that we Feldmans uh, know well and personally now. So I want to thank you both uh, for that and for being here today uh, and for your con continued com commitment to work with CPSC on this issue. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Thank you for having us. And I'm biased, but I agree with you. Um, our folks are the best in the world. We're lucky to, I'm lucky to work with them. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Trumpka. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh, Chief Flynn, thank you so much for being with us today, for your testimony, and for your tremendous frontline leadership on lithium ion battery fires. You know, I, I appreciate your point that this is a nationwide issue. It could happen anywhere, but at the same time, it is uniquely and disproportionately harming New York City. And you, your department, and the city have taken solving it into your own hands in a tremendously com commendable way. And so I thank you for that. At the same time, you do deserve more help from us. And so I'd like to talk about your solutions, what's working, and how we can further help. So you mentioned that New York City recently passed a series of laws to deal with the problem. And one of those laws requires batteries to be compliant with UL 2849, 2272, or, or similar standards like that. I appreciate the logic of pointing to standards that exist for the sake of triage as we deal with this problem in the immediate term. And we've also done that. And I think most, if not all, of the, the witnesses here today seem to be advocating that we should at least adopt those standards as part of a solution. Um, but as we contemplate a more complete fix, there are some additional areas that we may want to consider. So, Commissioner Kevin, I know you're seeing hazards caused by illicit repair shops that are opening batteries, mixing and matching cells, repairing those things. When they put it back together, it may pose a risk, but that may not be knowable to someone looking at it. It may look the same. It may even still bear a UL mark that was on the outside container. Do you think it would be useful to include more tamper-resistant solutions to make it harder for consumers to open the batteries and to make it more obvious if someone has opened it up? Yeah, I, I do. I think we both need to look at how to make them more tamper-resistant, but also how to tell that they've been tampered with. Um, you know, I think that our marshals have encountered that, our um, Bureau of Fire Prevention that does um, a tremendous amount of our enforcement. Um, often, as you've pointed out, people can do this work and put them back together, and it's not always obvious they've been tampered with, but they're incredibly dangerous at that point. In fact, even a UL certified battery that's been tampered with is then dangerous. So we would definitely welcome both ways to prevent that tampering, but also easier ways for both our experts, but also even the average consumer to be able to tell just from either looking at a battery or a simple way of testing that you could know that that battery was unstable or dangerous in some way. And you've also expressed concern about the mismatch between chargers and batteries. Uh, can you walk us through what a preferred solution for you looks like to that issue? We would like to see, I, I think, two things. Uh, one is that they're automatic shut off. So that batteries either shut off when they're done charging or when they reach a certain temperature. Um, that's critical. You know, we do see that in a lot of other devices, especially uh, computers and cell phones. And we believe that's very critical. Um, we also want to see the devices that won't work, won't charge if they're not with their manufactured issue device. Um, a lot of, again, what we're seeing is a term they say Frankenstein bikes, but bikes that are pieced together, you know, both the battery, the bike, the charger, even parts of the bike didn't come. They all came from different manufacturers. And again, that substantially increases the risk. It also makes it easier for people to make something that's not compliant um, by piecing something together. So devices that don't work if they're not with their manufacturer issued device would help significantly in stemming that particular type of device. And, and with the automatic shutoff that you mentioned, it, it's my understanding that Good batteries have that type of shutoff in the battery itself, but maybe not necessarily with the charger that comes with it. Should we consider redundancies having that required in both parts of that equation? Yeah, I think redundancies, you know, from a safety perspective are 
always critical. Um, I'd say they're especially critical in these bikes. You know, a lot of what we see, especially when it comes to the delivery worker example, is that these bikes are using being used in a way they weren't necessarily manufactured for. So they're being used much longer for more hours and rougher conditions, you know, um, salted roads, potholes, that kind of thing, which could mean they're also more easily damaged. Again, even a safe device can um, become damaged through that kind of really rigorous use. And so to us, the more redundancies built in can also help when you're accounting for other uses that might not be the recreational one that the bike was designed for. And one of the things that, so cars have check engine lights when, you know, to alert people when there's something that's not properly functioning. Do you believe that it would be useful to have something similar for e-bikes where users would be able to see battery health issues pop up on their handlebars, something like an early warning system so they could take action or maybe even something that would prevent the bike from operating when that alert, alert would be triggered? I do. I would defer to the folks who are testifying after me in terms of what would be the most effective metric um, or even how to do that. But what I would say is what we've discussed here uh, and a couple of the other commissioners have raised, which is does a consumer, what I tell them right now that the bike in their home is safe and I can't. Right. And that's one of the trickiest things is there has been both a lack of regulation, so many different manufacturers, lots of people selling secondhand devices, um, even selling them online where people may not realize that they weren't certified or that they were secondhand is right now. It's nearly impossible for a consumer to really look at the device in their home unless they're an expert of some kind and know for sure that that's a safe device. And so I think anything that can give them an easy indication of that um, would be incredibly helpful in the future so that you know, in addition to all of the regulation, when we're doing education, there's an easy way for us to say, here's the one thing you do or the one or two things you do rather, you know, than right now it can be very complicated, right? And we're set, you know, especially in New York City where people don't have outdoor space, we're trying to give them five or six things to do that only mitigate the risk. Don't, don't make it go away. So the simpler we can make it, the better. And I think safer it will be. Yeah, that that's a tremendous point. And I think putting information in consumers' hands should maybe be one of the biggest takeaways we have because we can't look at everybody's battery. But if they can do some 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 uh, assessment themselves, giving them that opportunity, I think would make all of our jobs easier in preventing preventing runaways. Um, one other thing there that you know I've heard a number of times that these battery fires are so intense that when you look at it after after it causes uh, a fire, there might be nothing left of the battery. It's tough to assess what the product was. The the consumer might not remember the exact manufacturer where when they bought it or the battery. Um, would it be useful if these products had something, or, or would it be feasible in your experience if these cars had something, or sorry, if the bikes had something or the battery said something like a car VIN number, something that was was matched, um, etched metal that could survive a fire? I think anything where we could, you know, track back to the manufacturer is helpful. Um, I actually defer to the chief just to talk about the amount of damage they see and what these look like when they actually collect them after a fire. Yeah, uh, that would be helpful uh, in certain situations. Um, sometimes that casing is not available to us uh, after after a fire, after overhaul. Uh, overhaul is a uh, process that firefighters take post-fire to make sure there's no fire extension, make sure that we've been able to get to every area of, of the uh, occupancy that, that had fire damage. So it's pretty extensive. Um, the, when we get there to do the investigation, uh, the amount of damage is extremely, extremely extensive, uh, but everything helps. There are times where that would would be effective for us. As the commissioner mentioned, a lot of these devices that we're discovering are uh, bought from the secondary marketplace. So uh, the person that owns it doesn't really know it was subjected to before they took possession of it. They don't know where it was purchased from or when, uh, what it was used for. Uh, th those are questions that we're asking the consumer. Uh, a lot of that, a lot of our information is gathered via investigation, which which is uh, very helpful um, for your investigators as well. You know, we we do investigations, we do interviews. It, it's not solely uh, based on the physical examination of the device, um, due to the fact that so much damage is caused by these fires. Thank you. Thank you so much for lending us your expertise today and for your help on this issue and, and for your continuing work on this going forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Boyle. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Kavanaugh and Chief Flynn for your testimony today. I really appreciate your willingness to work so collaboratively with us. It's really important in advancing issues. As a New Yorker, I'm from Brooklyn, and my family is now in Rockaway, which, as you know, is home to many uh, firefighters uh, from New York. So I really am grateful for all that you're doing and continue to do. A lot of good questions have already been asked, and I just want to follow up a little bit on something you said, Chief Flynn, about it being, you know, it's not just a New York City issue. And you're on the vanguard for sure. I'm just wondering if you've actually consulted with any of your international counterparts. I'm understanding that there are fires in London as well. Um, they don't seem to be of the same magnitude as in New York, although I would say London and New York, New York always uh, a better uh, the, the the top city. But it, you know they they are certainly comparable. And I'm just wondering if you have um, consulted with your international counterparts. Certainly, uh, not not just internationally, but nationally. Uh, we we actually held a symposium uh, last year, last September, uh, where we invited um, fire departments from all over the world to to attend and to express to them uh, the issue that we're facing here. Uh, I think that was attended by over 300, 300 people uh, from all over the world, uh, many from uh, the United States, but others from outside the United States. Uh, we've been in touch with London also. London uh, faced this issue um, as well as the Asian countries well before we really recognized this problem. Uh, they were they were going through this problem. I think the uh, the use of these devices uh, started earlier there uh, than than we experienced it. Uh, so we have been in in touch with them uh, regularly, and we actually plan another symposium uh, next year where we actually uh, are expecting thousands of, of people to attend to share not only what we're experiencing, but but what they are experiencing also. And I think a few countries actually adopted that standard. Uh, the UL standard, and and they did uh, experience a uh, dramatic decrease in in uh, these. Do you have information on what those countries were, and if others, what other standards um, uh, different countries are using? Well, well one I could, I could say with Singapore, I, uh, we uh, reviewed the Sing Singapore study. Um, they they expressed that when they adopted that standard, they they experienced a thirty three percent decline in. Uh, fires caused by the micro mobility devices uh, powered by lithium ion batteries. Thank you very much. I don't have any additional questions and just want to say thank you again for coming. I do really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, thank you, Commissioner Kavanaugh, uh, Chief Flynn. Really appreciate it. Um, that's going to conclude our first panel. We have a full day afterwards. So thank you again, both for your time and for making the trip here today. Sure. We look forward to working with you on this. It's very important. So thank you for having us. We're now going to move to our second panel. The second panel can come up as uh, we get ready. And I pause for a minute because I know that there is a lot of people. All right, as people are settling in, I'm just gonna introduce our second panel. Uh, we have Dr. Judy, and please correct me when I get your name wrong. Uh, Jeeva Rajan, thank you. Vice President and Executive Director for UL Research uh, Institutes, uh, Electrochemical Safety Research Institute. We have Dr. Michael Peck. Peck. Uh, Director and Distinguished Professor for the Center of Advanced Life Cycle Engineering at the University of Maryland. We have Dr. Uh, Drew. I'm going to also, uh, I've, Herrera, thank you very much. Um, as somebody whose name can't be pronounced either, I, I tried, but uh, often fail in terms of getting people's names wrong. Dr. Herrera is Research and Development Manager uh, for uh, Satira. Uh, Soterra, thank you, Soterra, uh, Battery Innovation Group, uh, Matt Moore, it's General Policy Council for People for Bikes Coalition. We have Michael Fritz, uh, Chief Technology Answer, uh, Officer for Human Powered Solutions on behalf of the National Bicycle Dealers Association. And 
We have Lorraine uh, Carley, Vice President for Outreach and Advocacy at the National Fire Protection Association. Thank you all for joining and for your cramped quarters. So um, with that, uh, please begin. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Saudik, for that introduction. And thank you, Commissioner Boyle, Commissioner uh, Feldman, and Commissioner Trumka for holding this hearing today. I think we are all aware of the importance of this issue, and I applaud you. Uh, applaud you all for taking the necessary steps to understand and address this issue with lithium-ion battery fires. Lithium-ion rechargeable batteries first commercialized in the 1990s still maintain their rank for the battery chemistry with the highest energy density, long cycle life, low self-discharge, and no memory effect. And today, they're also capable of being use, used in high-rate applications. Due to the nature of this battery chemistry and its high energy density, it is used in a multitude of applications, from consumer devices to electric vehicles and stationary grid energy storage. It has also become a common energy source for marine as well as space applications. Associated with this high energy density, though, is the potential for cells to undergo catastrophic failures, generating fires and toxic gases if not designed, manufactured, or used correctly in batteries. Commercial lithium ion cells used in low voltage and low capacity designs to power cameras, camcorders, and laptops in the late 1990s are currently used uh, in kilowatt hour and megawatt hour and gigawatt hour sizes. Uh, in battery designs. Internal protective devices used in these commercial cell designs used to protect from off-nominal conditions such as overcharge and external shot. Um, however, these devices are only effective when they are used in these low voltage and low capacity battery designs. Limitations of the internal protective devices actually make them a hazard when they are activated under high voltage and high current conditions, causing catastrophic failures and hence External battery controls are required to prevent these from actually activating under these off-nominal conditions. The use of dedicated chargers that are designed to charge a battery pack after an initial handshake is critical for safe charging of all lithium-ion batteries, irrespective of the battery size. And when I say battery size, I mean voltage and capacity. The handshake between the battery and the charger confirms that the charger recognizes the battery chemistry, the voltage, the maximum current for charge, state of health, whether the battery has been over overcharged or it has experienced other uh, off-nominal conditions, and also the temperature of the battery wherever it's applicable, and the uses and uses the relevant charge protocol to complete the charge. This is critical since lithium ion battery chemistries have varying end of charge and end of discharge voltages. And the lack of a dedicated charger usage can lead to an overcharge or an over discharge of the battery that may result in an unsafe condition immediately or may lead to a subsequent catastrophic event in the field. This leads to the recommendation that universal chargers should never be used to charge lithium ion batteries. The proliferation of lithium-ion batteries for applications in our daily life has made manufacturing of lithium-ion batteries a lucrative business. This has increased the production of low-quality and counterfeit cells and batteries that are sold online at an inexpensive cost. These low-quality and counterfeit cells do not have the required protective internal safety features typically found in commercial cells manufactured by high-quality original equipment manufacturers. Certifications to standards for such products is also lacking, or the certification paperwork as well as the stamps may be counterfeited too. Visual inspection of these products does not allow one to identify them as low quality or counterfeit, unless obvious mistakes such as spelling errors are made. It is best to avoid procuring of batteries from third-party sources online, especially if they tout extremely high capacities or if they are very inexpensive and can be obtained within a very short turnaround time, like within a week. High quality cells and batteries can take up to three months to procure since testing is typically carried out on these cells and batteries before they are shipped under a procurement. In addition to these concerns, counterfeit and low quality cells are being procured and, and batteries, especially for micro mobility devices are being built in spaces that are not certified for battery manufacturing. The batteries do not have the required safety controls 
chargers are not designed with the relevant controls for safe charging and fire mitigation and suppression methods are not available. So what can we do about the concerns regarding the safety of lithium ion batteries used for consumer applications, which can include our portable electronic devices, power tools, as well as micro and e-mobility products? The following are some of the important factors to keep in mind when procuring and using devices and products with lithium ion batteries. Procure only high quality products from OEMs, uh, that's original equipment manufacturers, or from reputable retailers and suppliers recommended by the OEM, and do not procure inexpensive products from online sources. Confirm that the products being procured have the required certifications, which are reflected by certification stamps or marks. Use dedicated chargers, meaning they are designed for that particular product by the original equipment manufacturer, and avoid using universal or aftermarket chargers. If building batteries, keep the procurement practices mentioned above in mind and confirm that all safety controls have been tested stringently and in the order required. Complete required safety certifications for each model of battery product that is being manufactured. And lastly, educate and create awareness on the safety hazards of incorrectly designing, manufacturing, charging, and using cells and batteries. Again, thank you all for the opportunity to address the Commission. While this may be the beginning of this conversation, I look forward to continuing to work with all of you on this very important matter. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Precht? So, so my group at the Center for Advanced Life Cycle Engineering at University of Maryland conducts research on reliability and safety of electronics, components, products, and systems, and this includes battery cells and packs. To date, we've conducted thousands of failure analysis of batteries, including those that didn't perform properly or resulted in fires and explosions. In addition, we audit battery companies. I personally conducted quality audit audits of over 50 battery manufacturers in China, as well as in Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, and the US, ranging from companies who make billions of batteries per year to restaurants that part-time make batteries, maybe hundreds or thousands per day. Um, my team's found that the production of high energy density lithium ion cells today requires extremely high quality manufacturing. Cleanliness uh, is key to having safe batteries, but regardless of the manufacturing processes in place and the standards applied, even the so-called good companies have had problems and have had to recall products. I think we should all remember to be aware of this. Uh, LG Chem has caused fires in the Chevy Bolt, Hyundai Iconic. There's recently fires in the, uh, Stellantis and BYD vehicles. And in the past, I think we all know of problems with uh, Panasonic in, in laptops, Samsung notebook, and uh, the USA in the Boeing 787. And all of those companies uh, passed all the, their products passed all the appropriate UL and IEC standards. Uh, clearly the safety risks are greater for uh, the low volume, lower volume and mom and pop shops who are making cells. Um, and uh, I have an example of that. So this example is about uh, a company called MXJO. They advertise as being in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Shenzhen, with specific locations given in their website. They had advertised and documented on the internet that their batteries pass all the appropriate battery standards, such as UL and IEC, and their batteries appear to be properly labeled. My team has checked some of their cells, and indeed, some of the bikes and hoverboards. In many cases, their cells appear to work properly. In some cases, the cells have been shown to quickly degrade, and in many cases have been known to explode and, and cause fires. My team's investigated a number of fires caused by them. In my visits to Hong Kong and Taiwan, an address, there was only a post office box. No employees could be found. And, and by the way, MXJO is registered in, in the U.S. as well. Um, 
my team has examined numerous battery cells that are being sold and incorporated in the products, uh, not only MXJO, that are rewrapped with labels from well-known companies. For example, it is expected that most, if not all, of the LG Chem 18650 batteries sold on Amazon, eBay, and other such sites are, are not real or counterfeit or rewrapped. Uh, they could have been scrapped, they could be reused, and in some cases, there are other models of actual LG Chem batteries. In my team's view, standards and regulations are, are important and help, but they're not enough to stop the fires and explosions. Uh, UL has put out notices over 10 years ago that companies can counterfeit the UL labels. This is, it's, it's easy. Uh, we can't trust the labels and the company's websites, and even verification steps can be easily sidestepped. And also, this is understood by some of the big battery companies, as noted by LG Chem's ad in the Washington Post in 2020, uh, stating that the cus consumers shouldn't buy their cells because what you see on the internet is most likely false. Uh, one solution may be to hold the end product OEMs and the pack manufacturers more accountable. For example, pack manufacturers must show that they actually audited the cell manufacturers that's supplying the cells and perhaps show how they address some kind of minimum quality standards or practices. I also recommend that there be something like a guide up alert. So guide up is the government industry data exchange program. We use that for uh, electronic components um, because of things like these same kind of problems um, or something similar to that to be established to make manufacturers aware of problematic cells and cell manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pereira. Thank you. I should have some slides coming up. Um, but to start introducing, um, uh, at Soteria, we started a project focused on doing e-bike battery teardowns to kind of look at them from the front end. Um, as the commissioner stated, it's kind of hard to analyze things after damage has already occurred um, to those battery packs. So we're trying to do uh, a standard analysis of e-bike battery packs available today. So uh, next slide. Sorry, I'm going uh, off the slides here. So in general, the product uh, project description is we have five popular OEM e-bikes that are uh, packs that are being torn down, as well as five what I would call third party cheaper packs that we purchased online that are compatible with those same e-bikes to get kind of a comparison there. And just to, to recap, a lot of the danger in e-bike battery packs happen at the cell level based on mechanical abuse, electrical abuse, um, defects in the cell itself, and then uh, environmental damage to the cell, which can be moisture, um, heat, uh, salt water on the roads, things like that. Um, and so I just wanted to cover some of the uh, most interesting results from the study so far, uh, but just disclaiming that this is an ongoing project that started in 2023 and we're still collecting uh, data now. So uh, next slide. Um, so really quick, I wanted to just talk about an uh, example of an OEM and third party pack comparison and just to, again, uh, there's likely reputable third party packs of, available out there where an OEM can approve it. But in this case, I'm showing sort of the extreme on the other side. Um, and so looking at the pictures on the left, the, the packs on the left look the same. They have all the same stickers. They, they uh, operate the same from the limited information about the packs available online. They have the same specifications. Um, and so uh, as a consumer, when you're looking at this, the only significant difference is price. Uh, in particular, um, in this example, the price difference was $500 between these two packs. Um, and uh, sometimes there's differing availability. The OEM might not have packs available, and so you're forced to go the third party route. Um, and so uh, just diving deeper, looking on the right hand side of this slide now, um, we, we see some major pack uh, construction differences. Um, just to describe it really quick, the OEM pack had uh, frames that held the cells in, uh, in a certain pattern between each other with uh, uh, enough space to prevent cell-to-cell -cell propagation. That's when one cell goes off and will uh, cause the neighboring cells to go off. 
Uh, meanwhile, the third party pack was glued together in a different square pattern with no spacing, and uh, that has a significantly higher impact on uh, cell to cell propagation. Um, also looking at the cells themselves, uh, we uh, opened them up and look at the construction of the specific cells and found that uh, even though they had the same labeling from the uh, tier one manufacturer, uh, they, they were actually very different cells in both performance and uh, uh, design, which indicated to us that there was likely an either a very old model of the uh, cell or perhaps a counterfeit cell that was being used to, in the third party pack. And so these differences are pretty pretty shocking there. And so next slide. Um, and then one of the biggest findings we've found from this study so far is, is gaps in BMS implement, implementation. So uh, BMS is battery management system. It's what's controlling all the cells to work together in a battery pack, which is usually made in e-bikes or somewhere from 30 to 60 individual cells. And so um, uh, some of the things we found in the gaps uh, are a lack of cell balancing. There's uh, an issue, if you have a one problematic cell and you're running the pack and all the cells are being run the same way, that cell that's out of whack or not doing too well will uh, likely be the cause of a safety incident or a thermal incident in a pack. And so cell balancing is one way to keep all the cells at the same level. And this is largely not done in uh, uh, battery packs, the e-bike battery packs that we've been looking at, OEM and third party. And uh, we didn't see cell balancing addressed specifically in a lot of the standards that we had looked at. Um, some other features on BMSs aren't being implemented properly. Uh, in particular, uh, we find chipsets that uh, don't use the temperature sensing capability. There's two ways that this happens. Uh, on one BMS, we found that it had temperature sensing capability, but they just didn't attach a temperature sensor to do a shutoff once it reached a high enough temperature. And we found that same BMS uh, that did have a temperature sensor, uh, which could have had the feature, actually didn't operate properly just due to uh, the temperature cutoff not being set appropriately is way higher than the cell's recommended range. Uh, and so uh, there's tons of better BMSs out there that just aren't being chosen. There's off the shelf options, but the cheaper option is kind of the one that doesn't have the features we would recommend. And so last slide. Just to summarize quickly. Sorry, did the slide change? I'm not seeing it. Oh, there we go. Uh, so PAC certification, I wanna reiterate what the others have said. Uh, PAC certification helps quite a bit. We only found out of our 10 packs that we looked at, we only found three that had any kind of certification. And so we, we need to think about that and then also how to protect consumers from counterfeit certifications. And then uh, my summary slide is last. So uh, next steps in this project is to continue profiling the riders to understand the abuse cases of these e-bike uh, packs. We have a project where we're going to fix data recorders to e-bikes and actually send them out to uh, sit the city to evaluate what vibrations, temperatures, things like that that they go into so we can better understand how those packs are being treated and maybe what we're missing in just doing the pack teardowns. Um, and then work together with standards developers to improve uh, and, and go uh, with the evolving marketplace of e-bikes. And so uh, the good news, kind of the nice note at the end of this is that uh, these technologies that can improve e-bike uh, safety are available today. And so uh, we, we certainly uh, can make a change very soon using uh, low hanging fruit technologies that are already available. And some manufacturers have shown a promise for doing this. So thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Matt Moore. I am Policy and General Counsel for People for Bikes. People for Bikes is the sole trade association for U.S. Uh, bicycle manufacturers, suppliers, and distributors of bicycle products, including electric bicycles. I think we've been referred to today as the reputable manufacturers. Our 335 members represent companies that produce goods in every segment of the bicycle market, from high-end competition bikes to affordable kids' bikes. And our overall mission is to make America the best place in the world to ride a bike by advancing good policy, safe products, and improved infrastructure. 
People for Bikes uh, urges a broad regulatory response by the CPSC that would require testing and certification of all lithium ion batteries for all electric mobility devices within its jurisdiction, including emerging categories of battery powered off road devices. This would ensure that these products have a robust battery management system. The agency should adopt established consensus standards for batteries, such as those referenced under UL 2849 and EN 15194, uh, a widely used uh, standard for electric bicycles, as well as the other battery standards already cited in the commission's December uh, letter to manufacturers. This would require manufacturers, importers, and distributors to use third-party laboratories and create a general certificate of conformity to establish their compliance with the mandatory regulation. Secondly, People for Bikes calls upon the federal government to act to stop the flow of unsafe batteries and e-mobility products across our borders. If the agency follows through and creates these regulations, those regulations alone will not be enough. Our research has shown there are over 400 online sellers of e-bikes who are not our members, companies that are not present in the United States except to sell their products to consumers. There are hundreds of generic chargers and batteries being sold direct to consumers that come in under the $800 de minimis threshold for a formal customs entry. People for Bikes ask Congress to react to exclude e-mobility devices, traction batteries, and chargers from the de minimis treatment and require submission of entry documentation at import to allow the agency to perform its task of policing our borders. I note that the European Union has proposed legislation to do just that, eliminating de minimis on all products coming into that uh, European Union to increase regulatory compliance and also to raise revenue. These regulate, regulatory and legislative changes will not have the desired effect if the CPSC and U.S. Customs do not have the resources they need to enforce them. While it may be unprecedented for a regulated industry such as ours to make such a request, People for Bikes calls upon Congress to provide adequate resources to the CPSC to enable it to effectively perform its mission of stopping the flow of unsafe mobility products and batteries into the United States. As we've heard from other speakers today, this is a complex problem with many causes, contributing factors. Other steps must also be taken to address the thousands of unsafe batteries already in use. People for Bikes, People for Bikes supports the proposed e-bike act which would help consumers with limited resources to purchase new tested and certified e-bikes. We also support many states and cities who have created e-bike incentive programs, and many of them are now requiring certification uh, of the products uh, in order to take advantage of the incentives. Battery recycling is also a concern. People for Bikes has created uh, an e-bike battery recycling program through a partnership with Call to Recycle Manufacturers who participate currently pay into the program to make sure the batteries uh, they import and sell uh, are disposed of properly and have a safe path to uh, recycling. People for Bikes also supports the CPS request that the UL 2849-2272 Working Group investigate ways to make batteries and chargers safer, more resistant to tampering, uh, and uh, to reduce the availability of generic chargers. Finally, education is sorely needed. People for Bikes has launched a consumer facing website that was co-developing with our advocacy partner, the League of American Bicyclists. We are also soon publishing a new e-bike owner's manual that contains uh, a wealth of information on, on safe practices as well as unsafe practices for consumers uh, of e-bikes. Um, the other challenges um, uh, are infrastructure. Unfortunately, there, 
there are accidents occurring in New York City and elsewhere that are not related to fire, but the number one threat faced by an e-bike user is actually a motor vehicle. Uh, people for bikes will continue to work uh, and we've launched a great bicycle infrastructure project just yesterday to help bring safe places to ride to more communities across the country. We are sincere thanks for hosting this forum and bringing together all of these great minds to try and work towards common solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fritz. Good morning. My name is Mike Fritz. I am the Chief Technology Officer for Human Powered Solutions. We are a consultancy specializing in the micromobility industry with specific focus on bicycles and electric bicycles. Humid Powered Solutions is currently on retainer to the National Bicycle Dealers Association. We advise the NBDA on many issues associated with bikes and e-bikes, not the least of which is, is the battery fire issue that is the focus of this meeting today. And we also very much appreciate the opportunity to, pr to present our perspectives on this issue and, and our thoughts and recommendations relative to addressing it. I have spent the bulk of my professional career in the bike and e-bike industries. I joined the Schwinn Bicycle Company immediately after graduating from college in 1973, holding positions in machine design, product safety, research and development, and engineering management. Upon leaving Schwinn in 1990, I worked in engineering management and product development capacities at Huffy Bicycles, Brunswick Bicycles, Pacific Bicycles. In 1998, I was hired by Lee Iacocca after he retired from Chrysler as Vice President of Engineering and Product Development and charged with the responsibility of developing and sourcing electric bicycles for his nascent company. I have since focused my career on the development and production of electric two-wheelers with a specific concentration on lithium-ion batteries as our primary uh, source of energy storage. The advent of high energy density, high power density lithium ion battery chemistry is the energy storage breakthrough that has led to the development and rapid proliferation of electric mobility devices. Lithium ion batteries enable the storage of sufficient energy and the delivery of sufficient power to make electric cars and micromobility devices practical and useful for any number of transportation missions. However, lithium ion batteries, like any energy dense storage medium, carry risk associated with the uncontrolled release of the energy that they carry. Gasoline is an excellent analogy. Careless storage, usage, handling of gasoline can result in tragic consequences. But we've learned how to safely utilize the latent energy in, in gasoline. Since the onset of practical automobiles, and until just recently, gasoline has been the energy storage media of choice for our mobility needs. We have learned how to benefit from gasoline in a multi multitude of transportation applications and to do it safely. Fortunately, we have developed a comparable level of, of competence with respect to our management of the energy contained in these lithium ion batteries. We know how to engineer, manufacture, assemble and integrate these batteries into our mobility devices. Properly designed, produced and used lithium ion battery packs are safe and reliable for this incredibly important application with a very, very low probability of catastrophic failure. When they do fail, it is usually due to misuse, damage, or other factors that are out of our control. Those of us in the e-bike industry that recognize and embrace our responsibility to provide quality products have an excellent track record of providing safe products to our consumers. However, safe, reliable lithium ion battery packs and associated charging systems are expensive, representing up to $1,000 of the um, of an e-bike's retail price. This often drives the cost of an e-bike out of the range of affordability for many users, especially those that rely on light electric mobility for their financial sustenance. Unfortunately, not everyone in this business brings the diligence and care necessary to develop safe lithium ion battery powered micromobility products. These unscrupulous distributors compromise quality and safety by building e-bikes utilizing substandard components to achieve costs low enough to enter our country with no scrutiny at the ports. This is particularly problematic with respect to their batteries. They take advantage of the economic situation of lower income users, such as the delivery messengers in New York City. Cheap lithium ion batteries are dangerous lithium ion batteries, as the experience in New York has clearly revealed. What have we done to allow this, or what, how have we allowed the situation to develop? In retrospect, we have failed to implement appropriate mandatory standards, as we've discussed this morning. 
We failed to implement a use and safety protocols and broad-based education for our constituencies necessary to ensure the safe and reliable utilization of this remarkable energy storage technology. This lack of oversight has allowed the introduction of dangerous e-mobility products into our streams of commerce. We have failed to implement controls to block importation of substandard battery-powered products by distributors more interested in profits than consumer safety. We have failed to design and implement a distribution infrastructure that can mitigate and contain the effects manifest when one of these battery packs fails. Humid Powered Solutions will continue to support the National Bicycle Dealers Association with its effort to, work, to raise awareness of these issues and to work to develop and circulate best practices for dealing with lithium ion batteries in their retail outlets. We will continue to support the NBDA as it lobbies for the development promulgation and enforcement of, pro of appropriate standards. We will continue to support the NBDA as it further lobbies for resolution of our current de minimis rules as they relate to the ability to import products that represent a substantial hazard to our consumers. And again, we thank you for this opportunity and we make ourselves available in any way possible to help the commission in developing uh, uh, effective solutions to this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Carly? Thank you, Mr. Chair and commissioners. Uh, the National Fire Protection Association appreciates the opportunity to be here and share some insights on how we can better protect the public and first responders from the growing threat of fires associated with lithium ion battery powered devices, such as e-bikes and other micro mobility devices. NFPA is a self-funded not-for-profit organization dedicated to the elimination of death injury, property, and economic loss due to fire, electrical, and related hazards. For more than 127 years, we've been helping governments, businesses, and the public reduce loss from fire and other hazards through codes and standards, training, research, and public education. We appreciate the collaboration from the CPSC and its staff um, in each one of these elements. Uh, make no mistake, evidenced by our discussion here today, that as the use of lithium ion powered products is growing, the challenges with their associated hazards are on full display every day in, in communities all across the globe. With lithium ion batteries are one of the newer and emerging fire threats in our communities. We can employ, however, the same strategies that have been successful against other fire challenges. We must attack the problem using the framework of the fire and life safety ecosystem, which is a comprehensive framework of eight components that are interconnected and have to work together to keep people and property safe. For this challenge, we need to look specifically at the regulatory environment, the use and enforcement of current codes and standards, well-equipped and trained first responders, and an informed public. A little detail on each one of these. More established regulations need to be in place and enforced around the distribution, sale, and repair of e-bikes, e-scooters, and other such powered products. Regulations related to the use of tested batteries and components, storage guidelines, and limits on the number of devices in various types of buildings can enhance fire safety. NFPA consensus codes and standards include requirements for safeguarding the use of these devices through proper electrical installations and other fire protection features depending on the use of the building. NFPA 1, which is the fire code, has just been updated to include criteria on how to better protect people and property where micromobility devices are stored and charged. There are product standards, as we've heard, related to batteries and components in these devices. Regulation should require testing and certification to these standards. The hazards that lithium ion batteries face represent not only difficult, but they're a unique set of circumstances. We need to ensure that our first responders are educated and well equipped for dealing with these fires. Last fall, uh, NFPA sponsored a symposium with FDNY Foundation and UL uh, entitled Lithium Ion Batteries Challenges for the Fire Service. That event continues to provide important information for the fire service. In addition, the affiliate of NFPA, our research affiliate, the Fire Protection Research Foundation, has conducted numerous studies 
to inform hazards, protection, and response on lithium ion batteries. Research and learnings must continue. The public must be made aware of the potential hazards that these batteries present. They must also understand how to use and maintain these devices safely and avoid those potentially deadly fires. This can be done through educational campaigns, as we've heard about, and wide distribution of safety information. I commend the work of Commissioner Kavanaugh and FDNY on their ongoing and very aggressive efforts to reach the public with these life-saving messages. NFPA and many other safety organizations that we've heard from have created tip sheets and other resources that provide that important safety information for public educators, buildings, and store owners, the fire service, electricians, on the hazards of these batteries and that the actions to stay safe. Everyone plays a role in ensuring that this information gets into the hands of those who need it most. A well-informed public we know must act and take action for their own safety. So thank you again. NFPA stands ready to support the CPSC as you tackle this very important issue. Thank you, and thanks to all of our panelists today. Uh, we're going to turn now to questions from the commissioners, 10 rounds each with multiple rounds as necessary, and going to recognize myself um, to start. And uh, actually, this is going to be more of a statement than, than a question. A lot of you were talking about the research you were doing. A number of you were talking about specific products that you were doing research to and finding that there are problems with them. I would urge you to share that information with the commission. So if there are specific products that are out there that we can investigate as well and take action as appropriate um, without a mandatory standard, it, it, we have to look at things in an individualized basis and knowing that there's a problem with something is the first key step in that, which also goes to everybody else as well. Saferproducts.gov is out there to be available for people to let the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission know about dangerous products that are in your home. If you're having an issue with any device, including an e-bike, scooter, or anything that we're talking about, please let us know so that we can do what our job and investigate as well. Also available for you to take a look at what other people report on Saferproducts.gov. But the first step for us is finding out about these specific um, issues and then investigating. So, um, with that being said, and that invitation being out there to all of you, it sounded like that there were uh, a range of products that are out there, um, vary from ones that seem to be built uh, safely to ones that are built extremely poorly. And um, I guess my question, and it will be difficult to know who of all of you to, to pick from. So maybe start with somebody and if other people have uh, comments to be a way in after that, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Pereira, are there easy ways to tell which are the safe products or versus the unsafe products when somebody is buying them? Great question. Uh, I think not to most consumers from the outside in, in my experience with buying uh, OEM and third party packs, there's a, a lot being done to make the outside look very similar and opening them up is really where you start to get that additional uh, information about whether they're safe or not. But of course, that that goes into uh, some of the questions we have about tampering and being able to open it up where we don't necessarily want to tell everyone to go open up their batteries and make sure their welds look good or or something like that. Um, so overall, I would say, no, it's not very obvious. Anybody else? I would say, uh, you know, if you find that uh, the, the batteries or the cells are really very inexpensive and then they tout a value that is not practical, um, and that is also something that people need to know the background on. For instance, an 18650 cell has a maximum capacity of 3.3 amp hours. But if you see five amp hours on it, then you should know there's something wrong with it. Um, and also, uh, you know, if you're going to get it online within, like they say, it's available immediately and they want to sell it to you, then you've got to look out for that. And that's what we have published a paper on that uh, on con on low quality, what I would call low quality and counterfeit. And we bought uh, cells that were that said they were from an OEM. Uh, and but we were able to buy it at one tenth the price 
Uh, it had the same capacity rating. It had the same label. It had everything that looked identical. Only when we uh, carried out some of the early tests, uh, which were off nominal tests, we found out that they were, did not have the safety features. And after we, after that, we completed our testing, opened up the cells, and they didn't. They were nowhere near uh, what the other uh, manufacturer, the OEM, was. So some of those, um, you know, those. Um, Destructive analysis may not be something that people can do, but I think they can actually look at uh, things like the, like I said, uh, the capacity that has been, uh, you know, on the labels, uh, the ease with which you're getting at the, the the cost. Those are all things that I think people can watch out for and make sure that they're not doing buying it like that. So if the deal is too good to be true, it's probably not a good deal for your safety side. Uh, following up on that. Can you provide sort of specific examples? Sounds like online is where you're seeing most of these uh, lower quality. I mean, are, are there, where are you finding them online? Are there specific places that you've bought sort of, sort of batteries and chargers and other things that you um, have found problematic? Um, I mean, uh, what the site that we bought from was Alibaba. So we, but we did that on purpose because in 2015, I actually was called in by a colleague uh, to look at some of the cells that they had bought uh, online. And when I looked at it, uh, you know, it, it said 5,000 milliamp hours. And, uh, you know, when we opened it up, we actually found that uh, they had taken a used cell and placed it inside another container and then put an external circuit board and then another label on it which said 5,000. And I knew the uh, the where they had bought it from. So we went back to that same site to buy uh, some of the same products as well as some of the others which uh, said that they were from an OEM. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a way to go in and get them. And uh, we have seen that there have been problems. It's prayer. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just differentiating at the pack level versus the cell level. We we were buying at the pack level and uh, uh, pretty much just typed into Google e-bike brand or model and then packs. And then we would go to the websites that looked cheap. And so in that case, it uh, tended to be a DH gate, um, AliExpress and Amazon were some of the sources that we we got them from. But again, yeah. Uh, the, the labeling on the outside can be whatever they want it to be. And it becomes even harder to analyze the cell to cell differences uh, when it's all put together in a pack that's that's uh, less uh, likely to be opened up and looked at for further inspection. So. Dr. Pratt, you seem to be nodding. Was there anything else that you wanted to add? To that? No. The only thing that I would be concerned about is that companies learn how to make money. So even though it's cheaper, as soon as you find that they can't sell the cheaper one, they'll make it more expensive. Like there's 20 grades of Rolex counterfeit watches. You want to pay $10, you want to pay $50, you want to pay $1,000. And I think the battery companies who are doing the counterfeiting and all this other stuff can address these issues once, once the consumers understand what the problem is. So I, I think we really need to get more to the source of the problem, which is how do we stop these companies or how do we have the audits on these companies who are making these products? Well, maybe a follow-up question on that to, to, um, to when you did identify them from Alibaba or from um, DH8 and Amazon, was there any outreach to those platforms and to inform them of the problems and did they take any action when you, if you did reach out to them and flag issues? Uh, we didn't reach out to any of them, but we, I have actually talked to some of uh, my colleagues in the OEMs, uh, OEM, uh, you know, companies, but what they said is that it's very difficult for them to go and take any legal action on these people because, first of all, sometimes you can't find them uh, or where they're manufacturing these things, and the second thing is it's not worth the money to go after them. There's some big companies some of the top 10 companies who've sent letters, I know I know this because of litigation, who sent letters to eBay and Amazon, Alibaba, Timu, Taobao, there's all these websites that don't, and it's not only the websites, it's it's warehouses as well and distributors. So I think you, you can't just say websites. 
Yes. Uh, if I could add, uh, uh, and this may seem like a simplistic solution, uh, consumers shouldn't have to worry about where the cell comes from. Consumers shouldn't have to worry about whether or not it's a counterfeit cell or a genuine cell. Uh, and the easy way to do that is to purchase your products from reputable vendors. Uh, you know, I, I, I could represent the, the top, not represent, but I can speak for the top brands in this e-bike industry. Responsible e-bike manufacturers source cells from reputable pack manufacturers. They specify the source of the cells, um, and, and they, they integrate those cells into their products in a safe and reliable way. The regulations for the high-quality e-bike manufacturers are basically redundant because they're, they're already doing this. They're providing safe products. That's what I alluded to in my, in my uh, statement. Um, so the, the simplistic approach to consumers is buy from a reputable vendor, buy from a brand name that you know, uh, do your research, uh, ask, the, ask the vendor for certifications to the safety standards. That is a growing uh, uh, reality now, primarily or thankfully through the efforts of, of uh, NBDA as well as UL. Uh, we're publishing lists of manufacturers who represent and sell certified product. Uh, the follow-on to that, then, is always replace your battery pack with a genuine OE replacement pack that you've procured from the same source that you got the bike. Uh, not only will you be certain that the pack is safe and reliable, it will match the charger that you bought with the bike in the first place. So um, that's not the cheapest solution by any stretch because, uh, you know, these, these brand-name bikes are expensive. But they're expensive for a reason. They're well-engineered, they're well-manufactured, they're safe and reliable product. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, it's the old adage, you get what you pay for. You know, buy a good bike and maintain it with help from the OE source of it. Yeah, I know that my time is out. I would take a minute or a few seconds and say, I agree with you, it shouldn't be on the consumer. It, the consumer, when they buy something, should buy something that's safe. Um, certainly, it's the retailers out there who are the, you know, the original manufacturers who are, out, who are doing this and doing um, uh, meeting the voluntary standards and going above and beyond that, that is the best. But honestly, I think some of the platforms as well or anybody, any of the retailers that are out there should be looking to sell things that are safe for their customers. And it shouldn't be on their customers to question about. That. Until such time as these regulations are, are promulgated and enforced, uh, the old adage, buyer beware, has to be considered. Do your research and buy from a reputable source. I'm out of time. Uh, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank you to all of uh, our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Dr. Pack, I, I want to start with you. Uh, you ran through in, in your testimony a, a litany of examples of, of products that purport to comply with existing standards, but nevertheless uh, experience hazardous in, in, in incidents. Can you speak to whether you believe that the existing standards, in, including the two UL standards that we referenced in our December letter and that we've heard from a number of folks here today, uh, uh, that that we're being asked to adopt as mandatory um, are, are sufficient and, and effective. Uh, obviously, performance standards uh, don't protect against manufacturing defects. We're talking a lot today about supply chain integrity issues, um, and, and that's not something that the standard uh, in, in itself uh, can address at, at the heart of those issues. But but is is that what we're seeing? Uh, effective standards, but a breakdown in the supply chain and the manufacturing process, or are the existing UL standards, do, do they fall short? I think the standards are, are good. And sort of what, what the other gentleman said, if it's a good company, they'll follow the standards. I think these are, in my personal opinion, in my groups, what we've been doing, I think it's not really the chargers. I think it's not really the BMS. I think it's, it's the quality of the supply chain, and it's at the cell level, not really the pack level either. So um, maybe you could have a standard that says that if the moisture is not controlled and if you have a clean room environment, then at least, but those are all things that cost money and um, make the good manufacturer, as he was saying. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could have a standard that says that and you audit the company. But if, if you're not auditing the company, then you're going to be in trouble. Okay. Uh, and you, you speak to this in, in, in your, the testimony that you, you submitted and presented as well, um, that, that a key part of this discussion is, is monitoring and controlling the, the, the supply chain. And I agree. Uh, uh, supply chain integrity is a, a critical part of the discussion, and, and, and not only this, but, but any number of safety issues that we as a commission face. 
Um, and it's just at the at the forefront of so much of what we see day in and day out. Uh, I've expressed a particular interest in the application of blockchain technologies to improve uh, integrity and traceability of consumer products, and also to assist us on the back end with uh, forensic work um, and and for tracking products in the marketplace for for, for recalls. Um, we've seen these technologies applied successfully in other areas, including notably agriculture. Uh, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts and, and, and thoughts of others on the panel uh, about other approaches stakeholders might take or possibly are taking right now with, with existing uh, uh, manufacturers that, that seem to have some semblance of control over their, over their supply chains about what, what, what works in terms of monitoring and control and, and what you recommend. Um, if, again, speaking from uh, from a basis of experience with with reliable vendors, uh, it, it's a very uh, in depth process associated with identifying and qualifying uh, quality pack manufacturers. Understand there are several levels of of in the supply chain relative to an e bike battery pack, and as has been pointed out on numerous occasions, you know the cell is the foundation. It, it, you know an eighteen six fifty cell looks like a an overgrown double uh, A AA cell. Um, the quality of that cell is paramount, uh, and I would agree that the primary cause of lithium-ion batteries are a failure of a cell, either due to a defect or an improper integration of that cell into a battery pack. Yeah, and we've seen that with the 18650 cells, right? It, we know that that a particular ha hazard pattern that that manifests is it, it presents when consumers open up and separate an 18650 pack into the individual cells and uh, either refurbish or or uh, use those in ways that they're not necessarily marketed and intended to when, when they're sold at the pack levels. Uh, this question is for you, uh, Dr. Uh, Jivarajan. Um, with respect to the 18650 battery cells, uh, you know, I'm curious what other options exist to uh, address this particular hazard of, of, of breaking packs open and separating into the, the, the individual cell components. Um, I'm aware that certain jurisdictions have simply banned the use of uh, 18650s as standalone consumer batteries. Um, at the same time, we as a commission could require uh, uh, protective circuitry either to the battery packs themselves or, or, or uh, to the products uh, that, that use the battery packs to make sure that they're being used as intended. Is UL currently looking at protective circuitry as an option to uh, address the hazards associated with the 18650s? Is that something that a standard is even feasible to address? So the standard actually, there are different standards. Uh, one is at the cell level looking at, you know, uh, certifying the cell. And there's, there are also standards at the battery pack level that uh, look at the battery pack. And then it, there are standards for different applications too, depending on the application. But what I would recommend, having worked with uh, lithium ion for more than 27 years now, uh, and uh, you know, in this, I worked at NASA and I certified the first lithium ion battery that flew for human rated space flight. I've seen 18650s actually uh, become a hazard because people try to remove them from battery packs and then uh, they actually short circuit them. Because when you look at a, an 18650 cell, there's, there are some safety features in the header area, and a PTC is one of them. And when you're trying to actually cut or remove a cell, you could uh, cr go across a positive and the negative, which are right at the top, and you can activate a PTC, but the PTC resets itself, and you never know that. But when you put it in the in a next application, if, if that PTC activates at lower currents and lower temperatures, and so you could ignite it. And that's something that people do not understand. So I would never recommend that you actually take a 18650 cell that's already integrated into a battery and then try to reuse it or re reuse to build it into a different battery. So that's something I would I would never recommend. Uh, you could buy new 18650 cells from a reputed manufacturer and then build up your battery. But again, you know, going back to what I just said, people need to understand how to build a battery. Uh, they need to get certified. There are opportunities to do that uh, and actually know how to build a battery pack. Uh, it's not just, you know, uh, there are two ways one can create a hazard in an 18650 cell or any lithium ion for that matter. One is, of course, uh, the manufacturing, you know, quality that Dr. Peck talked about. But the other one is also making sure that you design your batteries correctly and you use the relevant chargers because you could create an internal shot in the field 
because you did not design your batteries correctly with the relevant controls that need to be in place or with the relevant use, usage specifications that it needed to be used to or charged to. So I think, um, you know, just to answer, going back to that question, I would not recommend rebuilding with a with a battery that has all that with cells that have already been into earlier packs. Okay, but via the standardization process, is 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 there something more that a voluntary standard organization like UL can do to make uh, that consumer activity more difficult or to to uh, to, to put safety prophylaxis in place, and if the UL standard doesn't or, or, or can't do that, is is that something that we as a commission might consider adopting as, as part of a mandatory standard? So there is a UL standard for reuse of uh, you know batteries that I think it was written more for taking uh, electric vehicle batteries and putting it into grid energy storage applications, and so we go through and you know we've actually written three papers on aging and safety, uh, so we. It goes through all the different tests that need to be carried out, and if that is all done stringently, uh, then you could take uh, you know modules and put it into newer battery packs because there are some really stringent uh, tests that can be done to confirm that you know your batteries are safe uh, to be used. Um, I think that would be a, you know a, a good standard to follow the UL nineteen seventy four. Is there a technology that disables a battery pack if the cells are broken apart? Um, the health of the battery can be on this. The, um, did you say redone a battery that yeah, is redone? If you take a battery pack at the pack level and separate it individual cells, is, is there technology that's available to disable the individual cells? I'm seeing some head shaking now. Right now, no. Okay. Commissioner, if I could speak to that. Yes, sir. One of the one of the things that People for Bikes has been concerned about is uh, the recent introduction of lots of state level right to repair bills. Um, they ordinarily exclude uh, electric motor vehicles, but they don't often exclude uh, electric bicycles, scooters, and mopeds. Um, these would require manufacturers to provide essentially all the information, technical information used to design and service the product to consumers who lack the skills to do so. Um, this is a big concern for us. The laws are certainly well intentioned to allow consumers to fix consumer products. However, we don't believe that electric bicycles and mobility products should be included on that list. Um, and, and it is a growing concern as, as uh, my own home state of Minnesota has just passed a bill that would do so and uh, uh, really would be inappropriate as we've heard today. I appreciate that perspective. I see that I'm over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Trumka. Mr. Moore, you prevented me from guessing. I was wondering if it was upstate New York or Minnesota. I, I always get the two accents confused. I didn't know I had an accent until I came. Thought it on just a couple of words. Um, uh, so, so I, you know, I, we have a lot of expertise gathered before us. I want to get the benefit of all that. So I have a series of questions that I'll ask all of you to address. Some of them might require technical expertise. I know that not everybody's an engineer. Feel free to pass if it is not something you would know. Um, and I've also tried to draft them in a way that would allow for concise answers because I want, want to cover a lot of ground. So, you know, I know that there are certain conditions tracked in battery management systems to try to detect dangerous conditions before we have a problem, voltage, temperature, et cetera. You know, I'm curious about one that I haven't heard discussed in that context but that we might want to be thinking about, and that's the state of health, which I think you started to mention at the at the end of the questions to Commissioner Feldman. Um, always wear down over time, they get damaged, and it's my understanding that can also pose a risk of thermal runaway. So below what state of health, and maybe expressed as a percentage, do we start getting worried about that? Is it a number that, that each of you could offer? We can start with Dr. Jivarajan and, and go through each of the, the witnesses. State of health is a very, um, it's not easy to define for lithium ion. Uh, if you look at uh, its age, uh, typically, if you look at mo most battery chemistries, we say at 20% capacity fade, it's no longer to be used. But with lithium ion, because it can still function and it can still provide a lot of power, we say that it can be reused in new applications uh, as long as we go through all the testing and certification that's required for a second life. 
When you look at state of health, uh, I think uh, the BMS or the battery management system should actually recognize when there is an off nominal condition that the battery has been exposed to. Uh, that, that is uh, something that can be incorporated uh, and we do know, and you know, give, going back to some of the work I've done before with the Boeing 787 investigation, uh, there was a signal that would actually come up on the display that said the battery was actually over discharged, but then it would stay on for some time and then it would disappear. So unless the mechanic or the technician was actually looking at the screen while that message was going on, they would never know that this particular battery had been over discharged. And the manufacturer had said any time the battery was over discharged, never use it again. So there are ways that you can actually tell if you know it had gone beyond its limits uh, in terms of whether it's temperature, whether it's uh, voltages and so on. Um, that can reflect as a state of health. Uh, another thing would be if you see really uh, uh, you have a wealth of knowledge and I and I can see it spilling over but if we're talking about current capacity over original capacity a simple definition I'm thinking of for the state of health you mentioned so 20 percent degradation so so 80 percent health might be a number to watch out for yeah, that really doesn't well, let's go down the line Mr. Peck you say that's a no what, what do you say Mr. Peck it, I, I don't think there's any value. I mean, people keep their cell phones for a long time. They just charge it more often. So you can, I think Judy's actually saying that you can go down to 30% state of health. It's still okay. Just don't over discharge. Yeah. I, I would differ a little bit. Uh, overall, I agree, but state of health at some point you're overworking the cells and cells that are overworked are more likely to deviate from each other and heat up at different rates. And I think that non-uniformity in the pack is where it becomes a more significant issue. Uh, but overall, it's uh, you know pretty standard. I think 80% to 60% state of charge is kind of a common uh, rule to follow, but that the cell themselves degraded that much is actually safer because it has less capacity to release. It's the non-uniformity of the cells and the overworking of those cells that becomes the so, issue. So the 60 to 80 that you mentioned is for the entire pack? Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, well, and, and individual cells. And individual cells? Yeah. Okay. I would defer to my colleague, Mr. Fritz here. I believe he has an answer. Okay. Uh, capable, properly programmed battery management systems integrate a lot of intelligence and a lot of capability. Uh, state of heart, uh, state of health. I would agree with Dr. Judy. R basically, relates to service life. Uh, a battery management system can count the number of charge discharge cycles that a battery has gone through. It can also identify and flag um, conditions under which that battery pack may have been improperly used or overcharged or over discharged. A capable battery management system generally will render a battery pack unusable if one of the key parameters is violated, for, for example, depth of discharge. If, if you uh, completely drain your battery pack and let it sit for an, ex uh, an extended period of time, there is a certain amount of self-discharge in the system. The battery pack powers the battery management system. You can draw the cells down to a point beyond which they become dangerous. And under those circumstances, a capable ba battery management system will turn it off. It will not be able to take a charge. It will not be able to be used again. It essentially needs to be recycled. So there is that capability. And I, I think maybe the, the issue that you're pursuing here is uh, how does the user know that? Or how, and, and there are technologies. guess my next question. There are technologies that are integrated into battery management systems that do communicate those conditions. Um, in my experience with battery management systems several years ago, you needed to open the pack and connect to a data port on the battery management system and download that experience to a personal computer. And then you could go in and actually look at all of the service experience that that battery pack has realized. Um, you can look at the flags. You can, you can check the error flags to see whether or not there was a condition at any point that uh, threatened the health of the battery, if you will. Um, a lot of the um, more sophisticated bikes now are integrating communications between components, primarily via a technology called CAN bus. CAN stands for Controller Area Network. That's what controls the electrical system in your car. We're bringing it to e-bikes. CAN bus allows the battery management system to communicate with the battery charger. Dr. Judy was talking about that handshake, that, you know, whereby the, uh, uh, the, the battery management system looks at the charger and says, okay, you're compatible, I'll accept a charge from you. But it also has the ability to communicate error flags to the display 
which will tell you that's that's ongoing. There there have been technologies uh, around for years now that actually integrates a modem on the battery management system that can communicate with your cell phone that communicates then with the battery manufacturer to identify the health of that battery and whether or not there's any um, hazardous conditions developing. So to answer your question, the technologies exist. They're they're in, in the process of being implemented, but again, it costs money. And and if you're if you're trying to target a a user group that can't afford these technologies, you overlook them. Uh, we were talking earlier about temperature sensing capabilities. Can I, I? I hate to be rude. I'm so sorry. Oh no, no. <laughs> Dr. Carly, can we give you a chance I, I on this? <laughs> okay. Well, well. So you know, maybe I was naive to think I had crafted a question that lent itself to a quick answer, um, but I think. We should answer that question if we think there's a concern there, and there should be an exact percentage that we require as we, as we think through this for battery management systems if this is an issue for thermal runaway. So I'd like us to think about how to answer that. And let me flip this one a little bit differently then. You raised this, should consumers be able to know this? Uh, does anybody think consumers should not be able to know this? Please. So, so we all think consumers should have some ability to learn this information. Um, to draw the analogy to cars, you know, when you get that check engine light, you know there's a problem, you want to get it diagnosed. We need no. something comparable. Uh, uh, does, does anybody disagree with that concept that we should have something comparable there? This is tremendous progress. I like that idea. Um, so, okay. Uh, Dr. Jivarajan, uh, CPSC asked UL in February to examine how to make battery packs more tamper resistant. What options are there to make it harder to open batteries and to make it obvious if a battery is tampered with? Uh, I do have to say that I'm not part of that part of UL. <laughs> UL is three organizations. And I think uh, maybe Rob Sloan will answer oh. that question in the, in the afternoon. But I think if you look at some of the high quality uh, OEMs, uh, they actually have a sealed, uh, sealed device. And so it's very difficult to open up your device, put your new battery pack in and close it back up, up again and have it work. Again, the handshake you know, uh, needs to happen. So I think if you go with the high quality OEMs, it's not easy to tamper with them. Uh, and I would recommend the same. Uh, they're usually ultrasonically welded. So it's not like you can open it up and you know, stick it back in. Uh, so I would recommend that similar uh, practices be used. Okay, and let me ask one question on that. Does does everyone agree that battery packs, and you alluded to this, Mr. Moore, should be inaccessible to the average consumer? Is there any disagreement on that? I believe so. However, Europe has taken the opposite approach and are now requiring that cell that battery packs for uh, mobility devices have cells that are replaceable at the cell level. It's very interesting. They also have, I I believe, it's a criminal statute that that prohibits tampering um, with with uh, with e-bikes uh, to increase their their speed capability. Okay, I am noticing my time is up. Thank you all for for the information. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the panelists. I really appreciate your testimony, and I feel like I have learned a lot. Just to follow up a little bit, Mr. Moore, on the, your response to Commissioner Trumpka, can you just elaborate a little bit more on what the E? Uh, you, did you say it was the EU standard? I'm sorry. Yes, the, the European Union has a pending regulation. It's not yet in force, but uh, it is a sustainability uh, approach uh, to e-mobility. Uh, and uh, to kind of solve this problem of the expense of a replacement battery because e-bikes are so prevalent there and, and, and used in daily life by many people for transportation, um, they have decided that uh, th they need to take up kind of a entire product life cycle circular economy approach to e-bike batteries uh, so that a user or a you know, qualified repair shop would be able to take your battery replace all the cells and re and return it to you or evaluate for cells that need or cells re that need replacement within the battery um, perform required certification functions and then return that battery uh, to use but did I understand you to say but because it's accessible to the repair shops it will be equally accessible to consumers or a lot more accessible it it it's difficult to it would be difficult for a manufacturer selling in both markets to make it both very hard yeah. 
uh, to open and and capable of being opened uh, without having to replace the the uh, case. Okay. And essentially, you're you're replacing the entire battery at that point. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to stick with you and Mr. Fritz. I think both of you uh, have talked about uh, how you believe there's compliance and and the the. Um, um, I think you said reputable uh, companies are are doing the right thing. Can you each speak to what you, if to the extent you know what the level of compliance is within the industry to the voluntary standards? Um, given that the mandatory or the standards are are mandatory now in the in the city of New York, um, the uh, companies that I work for and are aware of. Uh, are working very hard now to analyze their products to see where they fit in that spectrum associated with the standard itself. Uh, my statement earlier was uh, not necessarily that they currently comply. My statement implied that they manufacture good product. And now we're at a point where we've got a standard. Let's look at our good product in comparison to that standard to make sure that we're hitting all the check boxes. Uh, we are, as I say, through the NBDA, starting to publish a database of companies that do have compliance with the relevant standards. Uh, companies are working as we speak to ensure that their products will comply. So um, the higher end of the industry, and I apologize if I seem to be a little bit discriminatory here, but but good products have been good products and will be, be better products once they're uh, compliant with the standards because that'll make sure that we're hitting all of the checkpoints. I guess that how do we know it's a good product then if we don't know it complies? The, the, the reputation of the company, if you will, for the time being, because, uh, you know, the companies that we represent uh, embrace their responsibility to provide good, high quality, safe products to our consumers. And I would say that many uh, such manufacturers are already marking their product, you know, with the appropriate certifications, test lab, uh, uh, the UL mark where appropriate. Uh, so that the consumers can see that uh, on the product already. I would say that uh, as as we discussed uh, with staff in January, um, there are multiple standards, and I understand that the commission has indicated its preference for uh, UL 2049 for electric bicycles. Um, many manufacturers uh, were voluntarily manufacturing to the European standard EN 15194, uh, or 4210 uh, part 10, which is a technical specification, not a, not a, 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 a standard yet, uh, but looking for this, the highest standard out there available uh, and, and designing and manufacturing and testing their product to that standard to ensure that's as safe as possible. Um, so many of those products uh, are perfectly safe and then the process of being also tested and, and conforming to yield 2049 as the commission has directed. So just to clarify, I'm not sure I got a complete answer on if there's a sense of what the level of compliance is I, right now. I, we have not done a survey and asked members to indicate whether they're compliant with yield 2849 or not. Um, but our sense from speaking with them is that they're, they're well aware of the expectation and striving to meet as quickly as possible. Um, I think my colleague Jeff Jambois can speak with how long it takes to achieve UL 2849 certification using the very stringent processes and requirements of that standard. And but you're not ready to speak to that. I don't have a percentage. For okay, you. I'm sorry, Commissioner. It looks I, like you want to. I can just as, as a snapshot. We looked at five popular U.S. OEMs. Only two had standards. But I would agree that probably the pack that had the most safety features, in our opinion, didn't have any standards, and it's likely that they're working on incorporating those. And so right now, I would argue that it might be a low, lower level at this time, but it's definitely being addressed. And is that because of testing costs that there's, you know, there's work being done, but the testing actually doesn't happen? Is it? As I, I referenced the European standard, because it is a global market for many manufacturers, mm -hmm. um, and, and there was a, 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 a greater requirement or expectation um, in Europe, they they chose the EN 15194 standard to design their products to. Um, and as of December, you know, they are playing catch up to uh, also uh, meet that standard. It, you know, with a standard, you really need to design your product from the get go to meet that standard be, uh, to satisfy all of the tests, the processes, um, the, uh, the quality control checks that are performed by the certifying uh, laboratory. Um, so you can't, even though you have a very safe product, you can't go in and say, you know, and get your test report in a week. 
it, it can sometimes take uh, months or years to work through that and make changes needed to meet the especially if you have a lot of a lot of SKUs or a lot of specific products in your in your portfolio uh, because every system needs to be certified as a system specific to that particular model so if you've got five or ten or fifteen different e-bikes in your in your stable everyone needs to be tested and, and certified so uh, cost is an issue um, I don't know that it's uh, considering the the ramifications of a failure if the cost is really relevant at this point because we need to make safe product uh, but it does certainly uh, consume a lot of time to go through that process okay thank you both um, let's see uh, dr. Jeeva Rajan, I, I want to say that uh, when I was looking at your background, I was really impressed uh, about your, I read about your background at NASA uh, and how seriously you took your responsibility in relation to batteries at that time. And I hope you don't mind, but I am going to read a quote from you that I think uh, 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 the spirit of which should guide a lot of our discussion. Uh, and uh, you were uh, are quoted as saying, these batteries were being flown in space for a human rated environment in a confined space. I took it very seriously because there were lives at stake. For the crew members, it was a high risk situation if there was a fire. And as a team of scientists behind it, we had to ensure that safety was our top priority. Hence, we never took shortcuts did the hard work and did everything in our capacity to reduce any risk whatsoever. So I think those words uh, apply equally today. And given your history uh, and background on these issues, I wonder if you could explain a little bit more than you have uh, to the extent as we're looking at developing standards, how we can anticipate issues so that we're not in the situation as Commissioner Kavanaugh said in a year or two down the road, um, you know, dealing with uh, evolving issues that we haven't anticipated today. So I'll ask you to look at your crystal ball a little bit and see if you uh, can sh shed some light on that. Sure, um, as, uh, you know, as leading the Institute on Electrochemical Safety uh, Research, uh, our uh, goal is to advance safer energy storage through science. So currently, we of course we do a lot of work on lithium-ion uh, fire and uh, fire suppression. Uh, that's one of been one of the areas of interest for us. Um, <clears throat> but we also anticipate, you know, like you said, we anticipate what's coming. So one of the areas we're working in is hydrogen as a fuel, and uh, so we're looking at you know how to safely generate. Um, and uh, store, transport, as well as use hydrogen as a fuel, especially in vehicles or other applications. So um, it is, uh, you know, just with all the experience we have uh, in what we've done before, we just look at industry, and and that's one of the things we did when we looked at aging and safety. Uh, like I said, we published a lot of papers, and all of that went into writing the UL 1974 uh, as a standard. So we work very closely with the standards organization to make sure our data gets transferred to them. Uh, we've done recent work on flow battery safety, and we transferred that information, and that information is going to the UL 9540A and the UL 9540. So our research is very oriented uh, towards making you know thing, everything safer, and of course the standards is one way that we can get it implemented. Uh, I also uh, chaired the IEC subcommittee for battery standards, and uh, we have about uh, eight working groups there, and we do the same thing that we make sure that we update our standards as we learn. And the proposal to look at uh, the quality of cells was uh, one of the things that I had proposed a couple of years ago. Um, it's it's very difficult to introduce uh, you know new uh, requirements and standards, mainly because you have a committee or a, a group working group that consists of all uh, sectors from the manufacturers all the way to you know people who are uh, selling them so it's very difficult like you know we talked about it is expensive to do a lot of the tests so we have to weigh and make sure that we have some good rationale for bringing in new uh, requirements and standards uh, but i think we made a lot of progress about after of the seven proposals I provided, five of them were actually incorporated, and we are getting a new standard out sometime soon this year uh, with IEC 62213-2. So I think uh, you know our goal is to help the standards organization with our science, and we will continue to do that by forecasting. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, and thank you again to the whole panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. And I have a request for another round of questions. Um, so we're going to start again and I'll, I'll start with just a, a hopefully a simple one. I mean, obviously we're, we're focusing a lot and this is a little bit follow up on the question that, that you asked commissioner Boyle, um, folks a lot on, on e-bikes because we're seeing fires related to them, scooters. Um, but obviously, um, doctors are just talking, um, the, this is a larger issue with lithium ion batteries. I was just wondering from your perspective, uh, are there other products on the horizon that we should be particularly conscious of, or is the sort of e-bikes and scooters unique because of certain of the market, uh, the price point and other things along those lines. Um, but start with you, but maybe talk to, to the rest of the panel as to what should we be thinking about next? I think any consumer device, uh, you know, has high risk if uh, it's not built correctly. It can, it could be just a single cell battery pack, as uh, Dr. Peck, uh, you know, mentioned uh, the Samsung Note 7. Um, they were, you know, they recalled it and a lot of manufacturers do that, but sometimes they do it after two years because they really haven't tested their product before it gets into the market. And so what I would also recommend is that, you know, that, that type of testing at a lot, uh, every lot level should be done really quickly. And, uh, and you know, if anything, uh, you know, is seen as a flag, that product should be removed. Uh, so I would say, uh, to answer your question, I think every battery product that would take a lithium battery type battery uh, should be, people should be aware of the risks and uh, the manufacturers and the integrator should be um, aware of that and make sure that they take all of that into account by using stringent, stringent testing and certifications. Thank you. Did anybody else want to weigh in? Um, yes, I, I think I alluded to my testimony to, to products that are in the e-mobility space that resemble e-bikes, but don't fit within the definition of a low-speed electric bicycle, either because of their their power, motor power, or speed capability, um, and so a, a regulation that created a new uh, standard specifically for e-bikes, as is under consideration by the commission, uh, wouldn't necessarily apply to those devices. And I think some manufacturers, as as they apparently want to do, are uh, uh, specifically designing their their products to not be e-bikes, but to be something else, uh, perhaps an off-road product um, uh, that looks like an e-bike um, and sold as an e-bike, but is not under that definition. And technically, the, a new regulation wouldn't apply to that product. It would be essentially unregulated unless there were a uh, overarching battery uh, safety standard that, that would be applicable. Um, uh, similarly, we've seen, you know, uh, e-bike like products that don't have pedals, they aren't, they aren't low speed electric bicycles. They're, I guess, low speed motorcycles. And the question is, you know, who regulates that and, and what standards should apply to those. And, and as we've heard the bad, there needs to be a battery standard for those products, uh, no matter how many wheels they have or what their capabilities are, if they're consumer products. Thank you. Go ahead. I was just going to comment that in, in in particular, uh, any small battery packs where the cost margins don't justify having a good battery management system, like a, a large electric vehicle, they certainly have really good uh, battery management systems. Those are particularly at risk right now, as I think there's a lot of uh, safety technologies being left on the table with those small margin uh, packs, I would say. I would just add, just from a, a bigger picture viewpoint, the rate of innovation and in new product development has increased significantly. And so how do we look at that from the standpoint of, we love those innovations that help power all of these new things in our lives, but how do we make sure that safety is going alongside of that and we're anticipating what those risks and challenges are so that we can uh, not impede innovation, um, but do it in a way that protects people and property. Thank you. Thank all of you. Commissioner Feldman, did you have additional questions? I do. Um, we were talking a, a little bit in the last round about the, the difference of experience in the United States versus versus the EU and elsewhere. And I'm just, I want to push on that a little bit more. You know, what can we learn from EU's uh, adoption of a, of a, 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 a battery standards here? 
Um, we know that that it's very specific with respect to the requirements for individual cells. There was mention earlier of uh, you know criminal penalties that are that are on the books. Um, you know the simple fact that Europe has a mandatory standard in place while well, while well, we don't. Are there significant differences in the safety outcomes uh, in, 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 in that market with European consumers versus uh, American consumers? And are there differences you know, in, in, in the, 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 the marketplace? Are, are Europeans in a position where they're still able to uh, reap the benefits of a healthy market and uh, all the attendant benefits of the adoption of the, the use of e-mobility solutions um, and everything that, 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 that comes along with that? I would Take it over to you, Mr. Moore. So the European standard has been in place since 2009, so much longer uh, period of time that it's been in place. Um, cycling is really core to the European transportation uh, experience. Um, there are probably 10 times as many e-bikes sold in Europe, uh, 10 million a year or so. Um, a large number of e-bikes are also made in the European Union. Uh, which enables, uh, you know, higher quality manufacturing and greater scrutiny by government regulators. I will say that e Europe continues to use self-certification by manufacturers. Um, the European Union sets the standard, the expectation. Uh, manufacturers are expected to test and certify to that to that standard and, and label the products appropriately. Um, we heard reference to uh, an outbreak of fires in London and my understanding from media reports is that those are largely related to conversion kits that are coming into the UK. Uh, that conversion kit is a battery, a motor, uh, usually a rear hub motor, and a controller that can be uh, uh, essentially bolted onto a conventional bicycle to turn it into an e-bike. Um, that is something that any future regulation should definitely address. Um, again, by way of the battery standard, especially because as as it's not a complete e-bike, it, it could it find itself excluded from a, a bike a, a regulation directed at electric bicycles. Okay. Does anybody else have anything that they'd like to add? Um, attendant to that, I, I'm curious whether somebody can crosswalk for our benefit, the EU standard versus what we're currently seeing out of out of UL. Are, are there differences between what's currently in place and what's voluntarily in place in the United States? And would there be conflicts? Should we move to adopt the UL standards as as, as mandatory standards? That that is also a great question for Jeff Jambois and the, and the okay. next panel. He's we'll get into really the next expert panel, on that. And and my understanding there's about an eighty five percent overlap. Some of the same standards are are used in both um the approach is very similar but there there are slight differences okay i appreciate that i'd like to make a comment on that i think there's a difference between regulations and voluntary standards and uh in in europe it's usually a regulation and people take it seriously because otherwise they get a penalty uh so i think that's you know when you when it comes to voluntary standards it's not required so only people who want to do the best they do do what they can um but since it's voluntary there's no need or there's no requirement or regulation for them to follow it i appreciate that perspective thank you very much thank you commissioner commissioner Chomka. thank you um also appreciate that perspective coming from a voluntary standards group, um, the value we can bring with, with a mandatory standard. Um, so, uh, Dr. Pereira, you mentioned cell balancing earlier on in your testimony and explain why that is important for safety. Is that something that's currently required to be addressed uh, under the UL standard? Um, under the 2849 and 2271 and 72, I didn't see it addressed specifically. They did cite some other standards uh, for um, BMS uh, certification, and those might have addressed it, but I didn't see it directed uh, directly addressed in the UL standard. Yeah, I've got trouble untangling all the related yeah. standards too, but but would you agree that it would be a good idea to be included if it is not? I, I think they have really good guidelines for a lot of the BMS functions and, and having making sure cell balancing is accounted for it. both passive and active balancing capabilities would be a, a good opportunity for growth. Uh, Mr. Moore, you've indicated that there may be up to 400 foreign importers doing to direct-to-consumer fulfillment through online orders. 
uh, because of the improperly high $800 de minimis level for imports. I very much hope you succeed uh, in fixing that with Congress. Uh, but in the meantime, if you haven't already shared it with us, uh, with our staff, can you please send us the information you have on those 400 companies? I'd be happy to follow up on that with you. All right, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Fritz, you mentioned um, well-studied failures on high-quality battery packs uh, that have been closely analyzed. And if there's data analysis on that point that, that you have that you haven't already shared, can you also share that with our staff, please? Certainly. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question here. You know, right now, um, I, I understand the best advice we seem to be giving folks in certain situations is to not charge batteries overnight, actively watch them while they're charging. Um, I get why we're saying that, but I really hate that it's come to that because it's not realistic, certainly not in the long term. Uh, and I don't believe we ask consumers to do that with any other product or that we should ask consumers to do that with any other product. I don't think they are. Uh, so I want to solve the problem. And I think we all want to solve the problem that would take away that kind of burden. And it's my understanding that that might not be necessary with a properly functioning battery system that's compliant with the UL standards we've been talking about. That the battery, you know, the, the battery would have a shut off if it's working right, the, the BMS would shut the battery off in an overcharge situation if it's working with the charger that it came with. Um, but under the UL standard, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I don't see a requirement that the chargers are also required to have a shut off, uh, safety shut off for overcharging. So that if you use the chargers that, that are interchangeable with other systems together, you might have a non-compliant or refurbished battery and a charger that doesn't have a shutoff. So neither would have uh, a safety shutoff for an overcharge situation. And I've heard folks talk about, you know, limiting interchangeability of batteries and chargers, but, but I'm curious if there could also be value in shutoff requirements for both the battery and the charger to have a redundancy to take care of that situation. I mean, can anybody speak to whether there'd be value in, in that as well? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, we, you know, talk about batteries being independently fault tolerant, and so they should not be depending on the charger to provide that protection. And it goes to what he said about having your over voltage, over uh, under voltage, over temperature, uh, high current. Mm -hmm. All those, you know, we have cutoffs in the high quality battery. Uh, but going back to the charger, the charger can also, uh, should also have the sensing capability to know when a particular battery, you know, is really not healthy. So if it can, if that handshake happens, then it can actually know if that battery had been over discharged and then it will never charge that battery again. So that kind of uh, logic is usually built in with uh, some of the high quality manufacturers. And I think if everybody ha was able to do that, then I think that would be uh, that would provide an additional step uh, towards safety and reducing the risk. Uh, I, I would comment that I think it would help mitigate problems when you do have DIYers tampering with their own battery, maybe having if they bought the OEM bike and charger in a full system and just swapped out the battery, the charger might help save any flaws uh, that they might have introduced in, into their um, DIY replacements or things like that. So it, it, I think it would help. Yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Any redundancies that we can build into the system are, are beneficial. All right. Thank you all so much. I, I don't have any more questions, but I do appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any more questions. Just thank you again to the panel. I do really appreciate it. So uh, thanks to everybody on the panel again. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to excuse this panel, and we're going to take a break and, let's say, resume at... 120. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to our final panel of the day. We have with us um, Robert Sloan, who's Senior Vice President and Chief Scientist for UL Solutions. We have Michael Becker, Manager, Technology Specialist, Engineering Storage for CS, uh, uh, CSA Group. Jeff Chambois, uh, Electrical Compliance Engineer for Trek Bicycle. George Kirchner, Executive Director for PRBA, the Rechargeable Battery Association. Brandon Martin, Vice President of Battery and Electronic Products and Industri uh, Industry Affairs for Outdoor Power Equipment Institute. Heather Mason, President of the National Bike Dealers Association. And Gabe Knight, Safety Policy Analyst for Consumer Reports. So thank you all for being here. And Mr. Sloan, why don't we start with you? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Robert Sloan. I'm Chief Scientist for Yale Solutions. Thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. Uh, today, I want to cover why lithium-based battery-powered e-mobility products present a fire and electrical hazard, and how these hazards can be mitigated with adherence to both battery and end product safety standards. Of the many products powered by lithium-based batteries, hoverboards provide a helpful case study of how product safety standards and certification can mitigate product hazards, even for emerging products. Hoverboards were a popular item over the 2015 holiday season, but soon became a safety crisis as a number of these devices failed catastrophically. When this crisis emerged, UL Solutions technical experts analyzed these devices to understand their failure modes, looked at the safety of the full system. Their findings helped lead to the first draft of UL2272 the standard for the safety of electrical systems for personal e-mobility devices. UL2272 takes a systems approach to the potential fire and electrical hazards within the device. The standard covers requirements for the design and construction of the device, including requirements for the device materials, components, and batteries, as well as the electrical, mechanical, and environmental testing the devices must pass to demonstrate that use, wear, and misuse scenarios will not result in a fire or electrical shock hazard. For the battery, UL2272 requires certified batteries designed and tested for the device it is powering. UL2849, the standard for electrical systems for e-bikes, published in 2020, also takes a systems approach, covering the electrical system for e-bikes powered by a lithium-based rechargeable battery, including both electric power pedal assist and non-pedal assist types of bikes. The systems approach is critical, no matter what the battery is powering, because the fault that causes the product to fail could be anywhere in the electrical system. For example, the equipment could have high quality battery cells, but those cells could be improperly balanced or controlled by a poorly designed battery management system. The battery pack could itself be perfectly fine, but, but mismatched with an aftermarket charger not designed to operate with that specific battery pack. This mismatch itself can cause a thermal runaway and fire. Or quality wiring between the battery pack and the motor or battery management system could also lead to thermal runaway in the lithium ion cells. There are many possible scenarios and the equipment design must account for the hazards of each component and their assemblage together as an electrical system to reduce the risk of fire and electric shock. In order for UL2272, UL2849, and the dozens of other battery and end product safety standards to benefit consumer safety, products must comply with these standards. Actions from the CPSC, New York City, and others are helping to improve the safety of the marketplace. Still, evidence suggests that without stricter oversight, the likelihood of non-conforming products on the market will remain high. The safety risk of non-conformance increases with batteries that are uncertified or that are being used in end products for which they were never designed. Applications that involve motion or are worn near the body deserve more scrutiny as they are more subject to wear, vibration, and environmental stress. Batteries being used in products or chargers for which they were not designed and uncertified poorly manufactured batteries used as replacement batteries also present a danger to consumers. 
Both OEMs and non-OEMs can offer certified battery packs that are specifically designed as replacement batteries for a given certified end product. It is incumbent on manufacturers, retailers, and dealers, as well as the product safety community, to educate consumers on the necessity of using compatible batteries and chargers with their equipment. While the Commission's focus today is on the batteries and the products they power, this ecosystem now also includes containment products and infrastructure, like charging cabinets and charging stations. All of these products should comply with safety standards or they risk providing a false sense of safety to consumers. I thank the Commission for the opportunity to speak with you and look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Becker. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Micromobility vehicles have surged in popularity over the last couple of years and continue to do so. These vehicles can include devices such as e-bikes like we've talked about, electric kick scooters, and other powered mobility devices. According to market research, the global micromobility industry is projected to grow 12 and a half percent between 2022 and 2027. However, as we've seen, along with the increase of consumer micro de micromobility devices comes an increase of risk of fires due to these battery failures. Although we've seen battery failures in New York City, micromobility device fires continue to be a challenge in many parts of the world and especially in densely populated cities where many use these vehicles for transportation or employment. New York City recently created legislation mandating that micromobility devices and the batteries and chargers used in them be certified to recognize safety standards. These recognized safety standards require that products sold and used for mobility purposes are designed and tested for safety and robustness to the hazards identified in the current edition of the standard. Today, some batteries are not certified to these safety standards and in some cases are sourced from facilities lacking the required production quality or replaced with aftermarket new or used batteries that have not been tested and certified for the designated use. Consumer batteries and the products that use them may not be subject to the same enforcement of safety standards as larger batteries. Stationary battery energy storage systems, such as those installed in residential or commercial applications, are required to be inspected by local authorities having jurisdiction. This includes electrical inspectors, fire marshals, and other code enforcement officials. In contrast, micromobility devices can be sold to consumers on any platform that may not require them to be certified to safety standards. All the related product standards do exist, such as CSA, UL, and IEC. They are typically not mandatory unless referenced by an installation code or legislation. CSA Group is a global leader in standards development, testing, inspection, and certification. As these innovative technologies emerge, CSA Group collaborated with the global standards community, as we've seen here, to be part of the development of these binational standards, such as 2849, 2272, and 2271. However, manufacturers may be concerned about the cost and timeline to submit their products for evaluation to these standards. Nationally recognized testing labs, or NRTLs, have attempted to make markets more accessible through various initiatives. The three standards listed above are binational, which allows products evaluated them access both to the US and Canadian markets. These batteries also use components such as individual lithium ion cells that also need to be certified to recognize safety standards. The, through OSHA's NRTL program, these components can be accepted by all NRTLs, even if they were certified by another NRTL, eliminating the need to repeat work. These types of provisions can help to reduce cost to manufacturers to certify their product. 2849 and 2272 are standards that cover the electrical system of powered mobility devices. The testing in these standards can help manufacturers understand the device's reaction to abuse conditions before they are introduced into the market. 2271 and 2580 also require normal and abuse testing to be done on the battery to simulate real world use conditions. This type of testing could include overcharge, short circuit, over discharge, temperature, vibration testing, drop testing, and more. Both 2271 and 2580 also require a robust safety circuits design, commonly referred to as the battery management system, or BMS. The BMS monitors the state of the battery, including voltage, current, and temperature. If any of those conditions go outside of normal operating limits, the BMS can terminate charging or, or discharging. One standard relating specifically to the BMS is CSA ANSI 22.2 number 340. 
This new standard evaluates the BMS's ability to perform its safety functions reliably. The BMS needs to be designed in a way that it can be relied upon repeatedly to either perform its safety functions or fail safely, but not allow unsafe operation of the battery pack. In summary, CSA Group as a global leader in product safety works close with manufacturers to ensure the products they produce are certified and tested to recognize safety standards. However, consistently deploying and requiring certification at the local, state, or even federal level can help to establish a minimum level of safety for all micromobility devices in the industry. Thank you. Mr. Chambois. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank the, this, the Consumer Product Safety Commission for the chance to speak on this subject today. Um, as an electrical compliance engineer at Trek Bicycle, uh, my job focuses on safety standards and regulations and their application to e-bikes around the world. So it goes without saying that I'm passionate about e-bike safety. I'll start today by outlining Trek's experience with e-bike technology, what we have learned, and my recommendations based on each of these lessons. Trek developed its first e-bike in the late 90s, so Trek has had decades of experience in this area. I believe the development of lithium ion and battery technology was a catalyst for the global e-bike boom we're experiencing today. And this is also when Trek's involvement in e-bikes really started to grow. Over the next dec decade, Trek has shipped over a million units globally, and we have sold e-bikes in over 50 countries around the world. E-bike growth in the various markets around the world led to the development of minimum safety standards. For example, China's GB17661 standard in 1999 EN15194 in 2009, UL2849 in 2008, and most recently ISO4210 Part 10, which was published in 2020. Throughout all of this, TREC has participated in the development or has closely monitored each one of these standards. And we continue to participate in these standards committees today. And this leads me to our first lesson learned. Minimum safety standards work. They promote safety and they promote growth in the market. Based on our observations, markets that require certification to minimum safety standards have seen far fewer issues with fires and general battery safety with, with e-bikes. Requiring minim, minimum safety standards also improves consumer confidence and regular, regulatory consistency, which promotes continued growth in a market. And so based on this lesson, we recommend that CPSC require that e-bikes, batteries, and their chargers meet certain safety standards. Specifically, we suggest mandating the requirements from UL 2849 clauses 11.1 and 11.2 for the battery safety and also clause 23 for battery charger safety. The battery and charger present the most risk in an e-bike system, especially when considering fire risks. So this, this course of action immediately addresses the core risks of these products. Also, these requirements align with the requirements being used by other markets and industries that have been shown to be effective. Of course, standards only work when they're uniformly ap applied across an industry. And so our next lesson learned is that we need to ensure consistent application of these standards. Standards are only effective if they're applicable to all the players in the market. As such, we need to address two major loopholes currently impacting the application of these standards. And that's de minimis import exemptions, as well as product scope issues. And so this is our second recommendation that these standards should be applied equally across the whole industry. And this can most effectively be, be done by either testing with an accredited laboratory and self-certification or certification by an accredited laboratory. We also need the CPSC's help to remove e-mobility products and batteries from the de minimis import rules and to push other agencies to enact similar rules for the products which, they like, which look like e-bikes but do not fit the definition or the scope of CPSC 1512.2 and are instead light electric vehicles. Products covered by these two edge cases exhibit an equal and often a higher risk to consumers. And so failing to capture these products and standards requirements is likely to lead to disappointing results overall. Finally, I would just like to touch on a couple other quick points. There's a lot of detail and nuance that could be not be addressed in the five minutes I had to talk today. I am more than open to discuss this further. So please don't hesitate to reach out with further questions and discussions. Um, our position on the fair repair and refurbishment should be that only that should only be taken on by the OEM. Lithium batteries are far too complex for the average consumer or even the average repair shop to take on. There's cell balancing, there's BMS programming, there's a whole plethora of, of technical details that need to be addressed. Finally, 
we echo a lot of the discussion thus far between battery and charger pairing. Although we don't think that the battery and the charger need to necessarily be paired together, that's a, a function of design, but we do believe that the battery and the charger should be able to talk, to charge efficiently, to have redundant safety features involved. Um, but one of the things we look at in the future is, is cars, um, e-bikes are going to be very similar. They're going to have to be charged on the street. New York wants to put in charging stations and, and things like that. We'll need batteries that can be charged by multiple different chargers, not just the one that's sold with it. So I think it's going to be really important to, to navigate this carefully. So in conclusion, we believe that the consistent application of safety standards to batteries and chargers across the whole industry are the most important and impactful steps that can be taken to address the primary risks associated with e-bikes. Getting this right now will enable the entire industry to continue to grow into what we believe will be a large and important part of our future transportation while protecting our consumers from the primary risks currently being attributed to e-bikes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirshner. Good afternoon. Um, I'm George Kirsch. I'm the executive director of PRBA. PRBA was established in 1991 and has for the past 32 years addressed the regulatory policy and legislative issues on the safe manufacturing, transport, recycling, and storage of rechargeable batteries at the local, state, national, and international level. PRBA's members manufacture approximately 55% of the lithium-ion cells produced in the world today. Our members also include leading manufacturers of cellular phones, notebooks, power tools, outdoor power equipment, medical devices, electrical vehicles, e-bikes, stationary energy storage systems, as well as battery recyclers, retailers, testing labs, and packaging manufacturers. Lithium ion batteries are an unprecedented success story. The batteries have absolutely transformed our lives over the last 100 years, or has transformed our lives over the last 30 years, and more than any other battery chemistry over the last 100 years. Over the past 32 years, we have seen lithium ion batteries replace older rechargeable and non-rechargeable battery technologies in consumer and industrial applications. For the past 12 years, PRBA has tracked the import and export of lithium ion batteries and many lithium ion battery powered products to and from the United States using your US Bureau of the Census trade data. In 2022, our compilation of data shows that approximately $281 billion worth of lithium ion batteries and lithium ion battery products were safely imported into the United States by all modes of transport. That $281 billion worth of products uh, included almost 1.2 billion individual products and batteries. Many of the lithium ion batteries and battery powered products in the marketplace are tested to voluntary safety standards, which protect against the unique hazards posed by lithium batteries. Most of these safety standards do not simply require testing of the battery, but rather testing of the entire system associated with the battery, which includes the charger and the equipment. This systems level safety approach is used for products like cellular phones, notebooks, tablets, power tools, and outdoor power equipment. It is our position that these safety standards provide the necessary safeguards for consumers. We recognize, however, the unique situation now facing CPSC with micromobility devices that may require regulatory action. We worked on micromobility safety legislation this year in the state of New York and anticipate working further with the legislators when they reconvene next year. It is important to recognize, however, that the 2024 International Fire Code that will soon begin taking effect in many states includes provisions for safety testing and charging of micromobility devices. There is precedent, therefore, for regulating micromobility devices. Should CPSC ultimately decide to take regulatory action on micromobility devices, we request that you consider the application of the ANSI UL 2854, 2849 as a mandatory safety standard for electrical system of e-bikes. This is a system level certification standard and many accredited labs are authorized to test to this standard. We have learned over the last 32 years, consumers do not fully appreciate or understand the hazards associated with lithium ion batteries, especially when it comes to repairing a product containing a lithium ion battery or the implications of modifying the design of a lithium ion batteries. We know that such repairs can compromise the safety components in the battery and equipment and cause a thermal event. This is the primary reason we have often opposed right to repair legislation at the state level over the last five years. 
We believe the most effective way to address the lack of consumer awareness and significantly reduce the risk to consumers is with a comprehensive federal, state, and local consumer outreach and education program on lithium ion batteries supported by multiple federal and state agency and the industry. The good news is the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Transportation are also focused on lithium ion battery safety and educating consumers as well as airline passengers. In addition, every state that has adopted portable battery collection and recycling legislation over the past four years require battery stewardship organizations to establish a comprehensive consumer outreach and education program on how to safety recycle portable batteries. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in the hearing today. We look forward to working with the agency on these important issues. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martin. 56%. In 2022, electric outdoor power equipment shipments represented 56% of all uh, shipments within lawn and garden product categories by volume. In comparison, new electric car sales in 2022 were much less than the total market, according to leading EV industry market reports. Outdoor Power Equipment Institute uh, was established in 1952 and today is an international trade association representing more than 100 manufacturers of lawn and garden uh, equipment uh, of gas, electric, and battery power. We also represent small engines, uh, golf cars, utility vehicles, as well as their suppliers. OPI members represent approximately 90% of the U.S. lawn and garden equipment shipments annually. So thank you for inviting OPI and myself as we appreciate this opportunity for dialogue about existing voluntary standards and regulations. OPI agrees with the success seen in voluntary standards uh, as highlighted in the CPSC letter uh, to supply chains of consumer operated micromobility devices, which was urging compliance and applicable consensus voluntary standards or safety standards. Compliance with voluntary safety standards in the electric outdoor power equipment market can serve as a model for success for emerging lithium battery powered equipment. OPI has been developing uh, outdoor power equipment voluntary safety standards for more than 70 years. As an ANSI accredited standards developing organization, OPI facilitates the development of voluntary safety standards for more than 20 categories of outdoor power equipment. OPI also serves as the U.S. Technical Advisory uh, Group Administrator to the International Organization of Standardization and is a member of the U.S. TAG to the International Electro Electrical Technical Committee, or IEC, which develops international standards for electric-powered lawn and garden machinery. OPI and our members are committed to product safety and digitally working towards continuous improvements every day with our standards. Battery-powered uh, outdoor power equipment has a long and well-established history. Advancement in battery and charging technologies have resulted in significant growth over the past decade and a half. The successful story of the industry's electrification is due in large part to the all-encompassing and widely adopted voluntary safety standards and product certification schemes. The all-encompassing 62841 series of electric product standards are holistic in design and product scope by establishing requirements uh, for the complete interoperable system that includes the product, the battery, and the charging system all tested together. So as an example, manufacturer designs a blower, a trimmer, a mower, a chainsaw. They all test those batteries to those products and to the chargers that come with that, and they all work together for safety. In the U.S., lithium batteries are also subject to transportation regulations by the U.S. Department of Transportation, which also establishes safety protocols. Under the DOT's hazardous materials regulations, all lithium-ion batteries transported in commerce must be a type that has been proven to pass safety tests under the UN uh, Manual of Tests and Criteria Selection 38.3. These tests address a variety of potential adverse conditions that demonstrate compliance with the requirements and OPI members comply with this test. However, detachable counterfeit and non-OEM OEM lithium ion batteries that do not comply with voluntary sta safety standards and do not comply with UN 38.3 create challenges within our landscape. This is a priority concern for our industry. 
Promoting general awareness safety is a key initiative at OPI and similar industry associations where we dedicate resources to improve consumer battery awareness and actively participate awareness campaigns such as the Be Safe Buy Real campaign, which is a global campaign designed to raise awareness among the general public about the health and safety risks associated with counterfeit and non-OEM lithium-ion batteries. Interagency collaboration with the Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Administration uh, in their uh, Federal Advisory Committee, the Lithium Battery Air Safety Advisory Committee, the EPA, Department of Transportation, or even state governments, as my colleague George mentioned in New York, uh, collabor collaboration on consumer awareness and raising general safety concerns uh, amongst the consumers is key as a potential response. So we thank you for the opportunity to participate on this panel for lithium ion battery safety as OPI welcomes CPSC dialogue on enhancing battery safety and addressing concerns regarding counterfeit and non-OEM lithium ion batteries. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mason. I am pleased to come before you as the voice of the National Bicycle Dealers Association representing specialty bicycle retailers across North America. Thank you. The National Bicycle Dealers Association, formed in 1946, is the sole organization representing specialty bicycle retailers across North America. We have over 700 retailer members, representing more than 1,000 retailer doors. We also enjoy association membership from several bicycle brands, advocacy organizations, and other firms within the bicycle industry. Our membership represents all segments of the bicycle trade, serving consumers of all ages. My personal background in the industry is diverse and includes roles in both the retail and supply side of the bicycle industry. I have had leading engagements advising both European companies and those based in the US on distribution of bicycle products and sell through to consumers. My extensive retailer experience leads me to be an expert in the field of retail operations. Witnessing the incredible growth of e-bikes and what they've brought to our industry, not to mention the benefit to riders, this topic is of great interest to me and one that our organization advocates for. The safety of the products that we sell, along with the safety of our retailers, is top priority. The industry has been struggling as a whole to adopt safe policy and procedure to best protect consumers, retailers, and the workplace when it comes to usage, storage, and charging solutions. With this, our nonprofit organization has dedicated resource to this topic and have on retainer Human Powered Solutions, who you heard from my colleague Mike Fritz earlier today, to advise the MBDA and industry on many issues associated with e-bikes. Additionally, we work closely with several experts and advocacy organizations, many in this room, to advise our members. We took a leading role and made a statement in July of 2022 to our members and the retailers and industry at large, urging compliancy to UL 2849. We asked our retailers to only sell products that tested to UL2849. I want to stress that the retailers in our organization, our members, are on board to reduce this risk and have taken measures and shown up to the educational opportunities we have made available. And looking at Safer Pass Forward, we envision a comprehensive solution, and our proposed solution is threefold. It includes rulemaking for safer products, as we spoke about today, enforced standardized policy on shipping, receiving, storage, maintaining, charging, selling, and servicing of lithium ion batteries, and finally, the production, promotion, and availability of consumer focused educational materials. Regarding safer product, there is currently no rule in place or safety standards that are specifically. Uh, applied to e-bikes as defined by 16 CFR 1512. The MBDA, we therefore suggest the CPSC initiate rulemaking to, at, as you see best, substantially emulate ISO 421010 or EN 15194 or enforce alternative that all products sold meets UL 2849. Second, we suggest standardized protocols, policy, and procedure. As we know, there are currently no rules in place for manufacturers, distributors, retailers, or recycling centers around best practices for risk mitigation. So therefore, we suggest that the CPSC work with proper firms to initiate centralized protocols, policy, and procedure. We would propose a relationship with People for Bikes, 
the Bicycle Industry Supplier Organization, to ensure that suppliers and distributors certify products to the safety standards previously mentioned. We would like to see a formalized adopted policy around shipping and transportation of respective product. For instance, battery imports, regardless of value, should have documented safety and regulatory certifications in order to be imported. Additionally, accepted safety information and materials indicating best practices on safe storage and handling should be supplied to every reseller. Strides could be made working with my organization, the MBDA, to adopt a standardized policy for retailers. In this, we would address several areas that retailers only sell certified products, that lithium ion batteries are kept in approved safe storage and charging cabinets, that service technicians maintain certification mandatory on repair of devices, and that training is provided on best handling. Finally, that retailers have in-store risk mitigation resources available. The MBDA, we've already taken strides here with dedicated education and a web page for our retailers, and retailers are taking part in this. Finally, around consumer end product education, there's no standardized widely accepted documents for consumers. So therefore, we suggest that steps are taken to initiate centralized adapted documents to be made available to consumers by every reseller, supplier, local municipality office, and others dealing in the e-mobility space. We could work with People for Bikes, this industry supplier organization, to ensure that suppliers and manufacturers of e-bike devices are supplying those with a specific owner's manual that outlines the safe storage, use, and charging of said device. The safety of the products we sell is of utmost importance, and the MBDA is happy to assist as called upon. Thank you. Ms. Knight. Thank you. On behalf of Consumer Reports, the independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, I welcome the opportunity to testify about lithium ion battery safety. Lithium Knight, ion. Can you just pull a little closer to the mic? Sure can. Thanks. Sorry about that. I've been told I'm loud, so thank you. Um, I welcome the opportunity to testify about lithium ion battery safety. Lithium ion batteries are found in a wide variety of products that consumers use in their everyday lives. From cell phones to watches to laptops to pacemakers and more, people rely on these high power density batteries for their fast charging and long lasting properties. Lithium ion batteries are also essential to mobility, including e-bikes and e-scooters, devices consumers use for recreation, commuting, and their livelihood. These batteries can also present serious risks. When lithium ion batteries are poorly made, overused, overcharged, or tampered with, they can overheat and even explode and cause rapidly spreading fires that are difficult to extinguish. As you know, since just 2021, micromobility products using these batteries have been linked to hundreds of fires and over two dozen fatalities, including multiple children. And the number of incidents appears to keep rising. Consumer Reports is glad to see this forum happening today because it is clear that the existing approach to lithium ion battery safety is not working. While there are voluntary standards for e-bikes and other micromobility devices that use these batteries, and some companies are doing things the right way, too many manufacturers and sellers have failed to take these standards seriously. In early December, CR published an investigation into the surge of deadly fires taking place. At the time, we found that only 13 companies were certified to UL safety standard for e-bikes. Our investigation also found that lack of industry-wide acceptance for these standards may leave lower income individuals at a greater risk than those who are able to afford high-end devices that are currently more likely to be UL certified. We were grateful in late December when the CPSC's Director of Compliance sent a letter to 2,000 manufacturers, importers, and sellers of micromobility devices, strongly urging recipients to immediately review their product line for compliance with relevant UL standards or face possible compliance or enforcement action. Hopefully, this served as a wake up call for those companies that were not putting safety first, and UL is seeing an increase in certification. For those companies that haven't taken action and continue to leave customers at risk, it is vital for the CPSC to follow through on its warning and press for recalls of their hazardous products, alerting the public as quickly as possible with the information they can use to stay safe. To address this hazard further, it is also important for the CPSC to issue binding safety standards. Indeed, e-bikes and other micromobility products are more popular than ever. They can be a useful, cost-effective, and fun way to get around. 
So it's all the more crucial for there to be strong binding standards to stop overheating and fires. These standards could come about through independent CPSC action or through the passage of the bill sponsored by the lawmakers we heard from earlier, which has garnered some bipartisan support and has been endorsed by CR as well as several others testifying today. It is urgent for there to be mandatory safety standards governed by the CPSC. In the absence of industry-wide compliance with UL standards and quick action to get hazardous products off of streets and out of people's homes, it is foreseeable that people will continue to be injured and killed by these fires. Manufacturers and sellers that fail to be accountable for product safety should not be able to simply continue leaving people at risk without any recourse. It's a federal standard applying across the marketplace that would allow consumers to trust that companies must design and build their products to be safe and that they will face real consequences if they do not. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Consumer Reports, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, and thanks to everybody on the panel for coming and uh, providing this your information statements today. I'm now going to move to questions from the commissioners, um, 10 minutes each, multiple rounds necessary. So I'm going to start with myself. I think it's been an interesting day. So some of the things that we've heard about are through the OEM side of things. We've heard about the uh, products that people are buying on, you know, sec additional chargers, replacement batteries, things along those lines, and um, the, the difficulties both wanting to have interoperability for, you know, charging around the city, things along those lines, as well as the risks that brings. So um, would be interested to know about how do we deal with this interoperability issue? How do you make sure that the replacement battery is not bringing in, a, you know, risk to, to your bicycle? Or that if you're using a different charger, whether it's one that you buy separately or whether you're going to um, a city charging station, that it is safe. And maybe I, I'll start with Mr. Janwa because you're in front of me, but others should be able to weigh, weigh in and think, add to that as well. I just start by saying that I I'm an e-bike compliance generalist, so I don't I don't know the exact ins and outs of of how batteries and and chargers are programmed to to directly communicate together each other. I know I know a very generalized view of it, but I do know that the ideal situation here I think is to really push all the safety back on the battery. Um, I think Dr. Judy also sort of brought that that point forward as well. Is that you know the battery should protect itself first and foremost. I think that there can be redundancies within the charging system, and I think CAN bus and other potential communication protocols can accomplish that. It can also accomplish uh, performance aspects in, in fast charging. Um, some batteries need to be charged quickly and then slowed down and trickle charged at the end. Um, all that type of stuff can be, I think, tackled through communication between the battery and the charger. But I don't think that the safety of one should depend on the other. I think that's the trick um, to be able to have interoperability and be able to to eventually have public charging stations and things like that. Um, I believe the automotive industry is is kind of the pioneering group that's that's been working in that area. And if we can emulate that, that would be beneficial for us. Ms. Sloan, did you have any thoughts? So um, I do agree that. Uh, some form of electronic handshake between the charger and battery pack would be helpful. In addition, though, um, there are standards in development right now that focus on the charging system itself. So there's an effort, understandably, in New York City to move these chargers out of private residences and put them into, if you will, public infrastructure sort of places. Um, that will also require some thought as to what those charging systems need to be, how they can be compatible with a wider range of of um, e-bikes and, and e-mobility systems. The other thing I would point out is um, in many industries, uh, it's a consortium approach where leading manufacturers get together and agree what the design uh, criteria will be. And so a similar approach could also work here where manufacturers could decide here's, here's a system that can work and not only satisfy 2849, but also provide that interoperability across multiple known brands. I think one of the challenges we see right now is just the simple fragmentation of this industry, that it's a fairly low barrier, unfortunately, for someone to manufacture 
and frankly poorly designed in some cases an e-bike and put it into the hands of consumers. And so the points brought up regarding de minimis speak to that. Um, there are some aspects of this industry in particular that are particularly challenging. You don't see that in an electric vehicle. Someone's not going to, they're not likely to build that in their garage and pass that along to a consumer. Unfortunately for e-bikes, we do see those kinds of cases where that happens. So I think whether it's modification of the standard, enforcement of the current standard that's out there that, that takes the systems approach of matching charger to battery pack, or also an industry uh, consortium approach similar to Bluetooth or USB-C and those sorts of, of agreements among leading players, all of those I think could walk in the correct direction and, and toward uh, consumer safety. And the low barrier to entry that you mentioned is something that I've heard from a number of people, which seems to be uh, mitigate, uh, taking us more towards the need for a mandatory standard in this area as well, because you have too many players, hard to know exactly who they all are. Um, you know, Miss um, Mason, I mean, you talked about your dealers uh, and what are the biggest issues they are um, finding now? You you asked them to go and to you know sell ones that were certified. Are you having difficulty finding those bikes? And is your supply chains um, hampered by that? Yes, uh, there's there is difficulty to figure out which brands are certified to what. And so the MBDA, we took it upon ourselves uh, about six months ago to start a database available to retailers so they could see which brands have which certifications. Um, I'm listening to the conversation. I'm thinking of the earlier question about the comparison to Euro the European market. The difference there is that there aren't as many brands available and many of the sales, I'd say more than 80% go through a brick and mortar retailer. I would say the big issue here is the direct consumer or Amazon. So if we can figure out how to deal that and deal with that, I think we would mitigate a lot of the issues. Can you expand on that a little bit more? You say that the direct to consumer Amazon, where's the issue, where are the, the risks and problems the coming lower, from there? These are the lower quality product that's being sold online that is not certified and ending up in the hands of our consumers for the most part. To the extent that you have this information as to what's provided, is that public information or is this being provided to your your members or is there ways to be able to provide information to the public as to what are the ones that are certified to what? Our list is available to the public right now. Um, also, ACT Labs, which is a testing uh, facility, has a list available to the public um, and we're working to build up this dat database so it's more readily available. Great. Um, this is a follow-up if you could provide that information to me. I'd sure. appreciate that as well. Yes. Um, going to, uh, I'm curious, obviously we're talking about e-bikes at this point in time, the batteries, but a lot of the issues seem to be cross, uh, really about the battery itself. Um, and some of you have talked about in your written testimony, sort of the, the next products that are out there. Um, be curious, maybe start with Ms. Uh, Mr. Sloan. What are you seeing on the horizon and what should we be thinking about as well? So uh, thank you. A couple of, of observations we see. Obviously, lithium ion batteries have proliferated into so many different end uses. We are focused on those that are clo worn close to the body. We see more portable applications there where if there is an issue, if they're more runaway, you know, you think about earbuds and those sorts of, of, of items, those are, are high impact for a consumer. So that's something that we, we are looking at. Um, and then in e-mobility, I mentioned this in the, in the statement, but having a requirement that UL2849 be used for e-bikes does, we know through experience, dramatically reduce the frequency of events of thermal runaways. It helps ensure that those products will be um, higher quality overall. But when there's an event, it doesn't take away the severity. So one thing we see on the horizon is um, development of standards that can ensure that the charging and storage cabinets and storage facilities can withstand the conditions that are experienced in a thermal runaway. So that's actually UL 1487 which New York City Council and others are already, you know, they're think that's what's next for them in their mind's eye too, because as uh, Chief Flynn and, and Commissioner Kavanaugh mentioned earlier today, 
these are not traditional fires. These are more explosions, honestly, than fires. New York City, twice this year, FDNY has made it in three minutes, three minute response time to homes. And in two different incidents with a three minute response time, six people have lost their lives. Two in Astoria, Queens, and four in, in a Chinatown fire. So having technology on the horizon that we can test and know it will contain for a period of time these fires actually provides consumers and, and others who frankly live in the same buildings and have nothing to do with the e-bike but are impacted by it, gives them escape time. It gives FDNY time to get there also. So that's why we look at the whole infrastructure, yes, the system and the e-bike, but beyond that. So that's something that we think is important on the horizon to, to help continue to provide layers of protection for consumers and others. Thank you. Um, coming up the end of my time, so I'm actually going to let uh, turn to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to everybody that that uh, is appearing on this third panel. It's been a long day, but this has been uh, incredibly helpful. Um, I want to start where I left off on the last panel. Uh, I had asked a question uh, to to, and I'm not looking for a, a full line by line crosswalk, um, but I, I was told that the, the question I had about comparing um, what we have on a voluntary basis here in the in the United States with uh, uh, at least two UL standards. Um, and the European standard that that's currently in place on a mandatory basis uh, is the consensus of this panel that those are compatible. Are there major differences? Um, can you speak a little bit about the work that we would need to do uh, to to uh, further tailor what what's uh, embodied in the UL standard to make sure that there's consistency? I can I can start so. Um, we actually have, and we would be happy to provide a very short side by side. Uh, that would be helpful. Ian, uh, 15194 to 2849, and where at least we see the similarities, which we would gauge it roughly, roughly about 85% similar between the two standards. The 15% that's maybe not the same is, is largely with the rigor of, of what the electrical system is, is subjected to in terms of testing, but largely a, a match. The other thing I would say is based on um, our experience, I'm sure many others up here on, on the panel, um, harmonization is in the future for this. These products are too important, too widespread, too prevalent for that not to be somewhere in the path forward. It hasn't happened yet um, because 2849, it, it's the ANSI national standard for the US and Canada. And so over time, we would expect that there would be a global harmonization so that will become with that through that consensus process, a global standard, but that's roughly the match and, and hopefully that provides a little perspective on where would it make sense that. to pursue harmonization at the outset now, if we were to take up a, a mandatory standards process in the near future, or are, are there reasons that we would want to wait on that? Um, to be honest, that would would be your standards engagement, our parent organization who would, okay. would be able to best everybody's that. passing the buck, but, um, <laughs> It makes sense to me, Commissioner Feldman, that we we should be thinking of it and seeing it because, again, this is not any everyday area of consumer products. We know that this is important. They're super important to people's day to day. There's 65,000 delivery drivers and riders in New York who rely on this for their livelihood. They're not just weekend riders, which we also want to protect them. So I do my personal view is, yes, harmonization is, is in the path forward. Okay. Time I appreciate that. that. Thank you. Sure. Um, we heard in the, the testimony today from from Trek uh, that that uh, repairs should be conducted by OEMs, not consumers or even independent repair shops. And we heard consistently from the previous panel um, and frankly, from the FDNY concerns about uh, non OEM repairs as a major contributor to the, the risk and the hazard pattern in general. Um, and even as as the locus of a, a number of the uh, fires, including uh, fires with fatalities that, that have arisen in, in, in New York, for example. Uh, CR hasn't been shy about its position on, on right to repair. So, uh, Ms. Knight, I would direct this question to, to you. How would you respond to, to, to Trek on the repair issue? Thank you for the question, Commissioner Feldman. Um, specifically with regards to these batteries, obviously we've seen a number of issues that batteries that are refurbished, often people think they can do it themselves or, or take them to non-certified mechanics and we're seeing a lot of issues. If so much as a speck of dust gets in there, that can lead to problems down the line. So when it comes to this particular issue, um, I would have to speak with our technical folks and get back to you uh, as to our stance on that. Okay. Mr. Jumbo, any any response? 
I I completely understand where right to repair rules come from. Being an engineer, I like to pride myself that I can fix just about anything around the house. Um, but lithium ion batteries are, are one of those technologies that are, they're just too new. Um, and the, the complexities with them aren't geared well towards um, the uninitiated or the untechnical. I think with a long enough time period that could certainly change. And I, I know some other folks have mentioned Europe, Europe just released like a 400 page super comprehensive battery um, standard. A lot of it was dealing with the circular economy and repairing and recycling. But one of it was that you would be able to replace cells and they actually eventually backed off of that saying that you could replace a string that was in in series. Um, but just because the average even re even repair shop couldn't handle it and they also have, are going to be coming up with a scheme to ensure that anybody that does do repair um, takes responsibility for the battery as the new producer of that battery and registers it. So I think uh, we can definitely sort of let Europe have a couple years to work with that and let them guinea pig it and see how that works. I Right now, I just don't think we're in a place where we can do that, though. Okay. I appreciate that. Mr. Kirchner? Thank you. I, I think it's important for the, the um, CPSC to recognize what we've got here are overlapping agencies. We've got the FTC who's promoting uh, right to repair. We've got the Europeans and uh, actually the states in, in the U.S. promoting battery collection and recycling. And in that legislation, they're promoting reuse of batteries. And so now we have these safety issues. And so we've got this conflict between state, national, and international standards and regulations when it comes to recycling, reuse, and safety issues. And again, our position all along has been opposing right to repair for this very reason. You know, consumers opening up products, getting into the batteries and replacing cells and batteries in, in our position is just an unsafe approach. And so it's gonna be tricky for this agency, if you do proceed down a rulemaking to try to address that issue. The EU battery regulation that he's, that he's referring to here is a, is a 400 page uh, regulation that addresses the circular economy and reuse and, and recycling and such. And it's incredibly complex, but I think it's important for this agency to recognize what they're up against in terms of these issues with safety and reuse and recycling. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Anybody else have? Comments? No, Ms. Mason. Uh, I, I want to be mindful of the time. You, you mentioned in your testimony that uh, uh, no consumer, um, that no standard consumer education and outreach documents exist that that cover things like, uh, uh, you know, informing consumers about storage and charging, and that's something that that needs attention in the in in the short term. Um, absent standardized documents in that respect, can you describe what consumer outreach your dealers are, are currently engaged in or have been engaged in with respect to? Um... Yeah, I, I'd like to retract my statement slightly. We do have a consumer facing document on the National Bicycle Dealers Association oh, webpage okay, great. Uh, that was made possible by Human Powered Solutions prepared for us for retailers to provide to consumers. And what does that cover? Uh, it covers how to safely charge, how to safely store, um, you know, just basic protocols for, for using your new e-mobility device. I'd like to see additionally an e-bike owner's manual, um, something that really des describes the technical aspects to give consumers a little bit more. And then additionally, safe riding instructions for these e-bikes. I mean, it's a whole different ball game when you get on one of these powered. It's a smile on your face right away. So, yeah. Great. Uh, Mr. Jambal, can you talk a little bit about what Trek is doing in terms of uh, consumer education uh, with respect to best practices and you know perhaps also with 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 warranty maintenance sure and that's a little bit out of my area oh that's okay a little bit more in the public relations area but i do get to see I, I do get input on some of that um being on the safety side and the compliance side um we do rely a lot on people for bikes and and people for bikes and what they're doing to to inform consumers and i know that we do have things on our on our website and we have flyers and a number of communications um i just can't speak much more i appreciate specific. that Okay, thank you. Um, I do see that my time is ticking down. Uh, Mr. Martin, I just want to recognize uh, your presence on the panel. I, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. As I mentioned earlier, I don't have a question for you. Don't worry. Um, I uh, uh, mentioned during both of the previous panels uh, uh, my concern that that this uh, discussion uh, focused too exclusively on micro mobility. Uh, I think that that uh, taking a broader look at lithium ion battery safety writ large. Uh, it is probably proper at this time for for our agency and and for all the stakeholders. So uh, I'm thankful that you're here uh, and for the work that you all are doing. 
Um, I'll yield the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Trumka. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sloan, what options, what are the most rigorous options available to make it harder to open batteries and then to make it obvious if a battery has been tampered with? So, uh, Commissioner Trumpka, the, the best options that we've seen include both uh, physical, uh, so sealing uh, the packages, also the way that the certification label is applied. Uh, there, there are options there where we could make it obvious that a pack has been broken so that the label itself is then broken. Um, we put a lot of thought and, and time into the certification label itself. This is not your average label that goes on a 2849 certified. It's holographic. It's difficult to fake. Um, so those are the physical options. In addition, the electronic ones we've we've referenced before, the handshake and, and ways for the, the system to reflect whether or not it's compatible and also if it's been tampered with. So those are the best options that we see right now. So when you say sealing the battery compartment, I mean, it, it, would, it require, uh, would it require special tools to open or, or what would... Because presumably we'd want to send it back to an OEM to repair potentially, and so those there are whether it's the design of the packaging itself, so it's difficult to open, or what, whether it's obvious, almost like pharmaceutical packaging, where you have tamper resistant types of of approaches, where when it's sent back to an OEM, they could then do the work and reseal the packaging. Those are the types of approaches we see in other industries that could also be applied here. Uh, for these sorts of battery packs. And, and when you talked about applying like the the, the UL hologram in a way right. that would be obvious, would that just be because it's cut at the seam or would it would it change the appearance elsewhere on the We've we've not gone to that step just yet, but that's that's a step that we could employ if uh, tamper resistant becomes a, a bigger focus uh, as part of the overall protections in place. Okay. Um and, and I thought there was a really good conversation on the state of health on the first panel. I won't open it entirely back up, but I did hear a few percentages mentioned and an 80% uh, state of health jumped out. Just to the extent there's a, a different concrete percentage already in mind we should consider, I'd ask Mr. Sloan, Becker, and Jambois perhaps if there is a number you'd throw out there to consider as well. For when a battery should no longer uh, be used or when it needs to be replaced? Sure. I, I, that or when we should trigger a safety concern, yes. So, I mean, f first off, the way that, that this is going to work is, is uh, it'll be a consensus process where there will be a number that's arrived at. I would say that something along the lines of 80% is conservative, but maybe that is what we need uh, for this approach. Something along those lines should work. Thank you. Yeah, I won't go into the whole science about state of health again, but as far as a, a percentage, you know, I think it goes back to the original panel where I, I wouldn't see there's a specific percentage because how you calculate the percentage could be different from one battery to the other. It's usually pretty proprietary how people actually calculate state of health. But if you're just using capacity, for instance, uh, you might get to the point where the battery can't be used anymore for the application. So that could vary if it can't provide the current or power needed. Uh, because of the capacity to degrade over time, then the battery wouldn't be usable. So at some point, the BMS would prevent the battery from functioning if it's degraded past a certain point. But there's no percentage that I would say. Mr. Jambwani, number add? I don't know that I could add too much more to that. It, it It is one of those complex things that there's a number of contributing factors and, and really the ideal situation is that a, a BMS monitors all those and says, oh, there's one of the issues this, this battery is no longer usable in a safe fashion. Yeah, no, I, and I understand that and agree. And, you know, to the extent we can figure out, and I'm, I'm glad you all are thinking about it and, and we'll figure it out, but where each of those measures that, it, that are factoring into the BMS, where each triggers to give us some understanding of what, what we're actually looking at inside that system. Um, Mr. Sloan, UL is, a, and you, you referenced the battery containment uh, cabinets that, that UL is looking at with 1487. Um, I'm not so much interested in the cabinets themselves, but is there any are there any materials or solutions that you could carry over from that work into the battery pack itself to to contain or mitigate a runaway event? So we are looking at that. We have separately developed test methods to look at the materials. So not just in a charging cabinet or storage cabinet, but as part of the pack. So that that is part of that work. We kind of did the test method development to look at the materials. Then we can test. Oops, sorry. We can test those materials in the charging and storage cabinet. So both of those have been uh, an investment we've made over the last year or so. I mean, does it seem like there are promising opportunities there to use in the um, pack materials? To, to be honest, yes, but um, these fires are 
quite intense. These are severe, severe conditions, both in terms of not only the temperature, but also the material that's being ejected from the cells. So I mean, we can also provide those videos so you can see what we're putting okay. these through in terms of the test methods that have been developed specifically for that purpose. I mean, the short answer is yes, we're looking at the pack itself and we're looking at the charging cabinets too, because they all provide protection mm -hmm. uh, if something goes wrong. So let, let's focus on the yes and put the butt aside for a sec. So what are some of the materials and things that, that you have seen that show promise and that's in the battery pack space? So um, the ones that show more promise are, are ones that have um, sort of less of a reliance on polymeric materials. You can imagine where a composite is more susceptible to fire degradation more quickly. Uh, so the higher the amount of sort of inorganic or metallic content in that material itself, the better it's able to sustain uh, fire conditions for a longer period of time, generally speaking. Okay. I mean, this feels like it could be a longer conversation, but if there's anything you could share uh, with us to read up on that, I'm fascinated by the, uh, the possibilities there. So, um, uh, Mr. Kirchner, you mentioned at the, at the outset that 55% of the cells uh, for lithium ion are produced by your manufacturers. How many, what percentage of that 55% are made in the U.S.? I'm going to say close to zero. <laughs> That might be the problem we're dealing with here. <laughs> but again, most of these, uh, again, obviously there's a lot of infrastructure going on right now in terms of producing cells in the U.S. I, I jokingly said 0%. It, that 55% uh, with factoring in our, our members from Korea and Japan, for example, and also our members who are U.S. manufacturers who are operating in those countries as well. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's a tip, difficult number to calculate in most cases, but as the cell production starts to ramp up here in the United States, um, it's, you know, we see uh, that number going up. I would say the percentage being manufactured in the U.S. I, and all kidding aside, you know, one of our uh, primary members has a very large factory here in the United States okay. producing for electric vehicles. So it's certainly much higher than 0%. Okay. So. Um, it, Mr. Martin, this, this is one minor thing um, from your written testimony. I did just want to correct because it's a, it's a minor point. I, I also have no question like Commissioner Feldman, but I did want to point it out. Uh, so you referenced the December 19th letter that our head of compliance sent to manufacturers suggesting compliance with, with U.S. standards, uh, but you said, quote, in his letter, Mr. K noted that existing voluntary standards adequately address battery hazards and ensure safer product design when implemented. And, and I just wanted to correct, we, the commission has not endorsed the UL standard as a full and adequate solution. I'm sure that's not what you were suggesting, but it seemed close enough that I wanted to make that point. Um, that that's the end of the thought there, but I just did want to point that out for the record. Uh, and then Mr. Sloan, last question. Uh, you referenced that the UL solution, uh, the UL solutions had identified over 7,000 reported incidents of fires and explosions from lithium ion batteries and battery powered products worldwide from 2010 to 2023. If any of that is data and analysis that you haven't already shared with, with us, is that something you could please provide to the commission? Absolutely, we're happy to share that. Excellent, I think that'd be that's, right. That's a conservative figure just by its nature because all we were able to do was, was scrape or pull the data that's been publicly reported ah. on a global basis. So I'm sure the, the actual numbers as noted this morning are much, much higher okay. um, because there's under-reporting. Okay, uh, and one final observation and I am cognizant of the fact that this is out of scope for today, but I thought it was worth mentioning. So um, UL 2849 addresses both two-wheeled uh, e-bikes and also three-wheeled electric bikes, which I hadn't spent much time thinking about, but I hope that folks who are, uh, are taking a look at stability issues there as well, because I don't, I hope we never end up in a situation with three-wheeled ATVs or anything like that. So hopefully stability is being factored in as well. Um, no more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel. Uh, Mr. Sloan, I did want to just follow up on a response that you gave to Commissioner Feldman when you talked about the 15% difference in the rig, uh, between the EU standard and the, and the UL standards. And I think you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the difference, the major difference is in the rigor of testing between the two. Is that, did you say that first? The, the primary difference area that we see is in the electrical system itself, which which makes sense in terms of the focus of 2849 specifically being the electric system. 
um, electrical system. So we can provide the side by side and where we see the differences uh, and in detail. It's, it runs about three pages total. No, no, I know you said you were going to provide that, but I yep. thought you in, in kind of summarizing it, you said yeah. that the difference was in the rigor of testing. And That's what we see. Okay. We see 2849 as a, as a more rigorous. More rigorous. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, EU standard, do you have any reason to believe that there's an association between the maximum speed limits that um, e-bikes uh, uh, can reach in Europe as opposed to the maximum speeds that uh, are seen in the U.S.? And what that I would have to go back and look. I mean, it, um, it's a great point because 2849 does have a couple of things that, that um, come into play here, uh, Commissioner Boyle. So one is the need for functioning pedals. And and I believe it's Mr. Moore this, the, in the earlier panel who commented on the need for a standard for e-motorcycles. There is actually a standard in the works right now already, which is 2850. We're not super creative in our numbering. So it, it, it does cover that next speed range, uh, which oftentimes I believe in the U.S. falls under the Department of Transportation, licensed vehicles, et cetera. Some of these devices that we see uh, in consumers' hands have been built to exceed the speed limits that a traditional e-bike, if you will, um, falls under. So it is a category that we have an eye on and we're working on on making safer as well. Okay, so you would say that the, the speed could potentially compromise the battery. It needs to be factored in for, okay. absolutely, yes. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, Ms. Knight, uh, you mentioned that you found that uh, 13 companies uh, were certified to, in, your, in the UCR investigation to UL safety standards in December. Do you have any updated information on that? I know I asked that question in the earlier panel about the level of compliance and I didn't get a specific answer, so I just wanted to know if, if, if you had uh, additional information on that. Thank you for the question, Commissioner Boyle. Um, so, yes, at the time the uh, investigative story was published, there were 13 companies that we found that were UL certified. Um, as to a specific number of how many since then have certified, uh, no, I don't have that information at this time. Okay, maybe I'll ask Ms. Mason if you uh, have uh, want to weigh in on that point. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't have hard data, but I will say since uh, the letter was published back in December, we have had more brands reach out to uh, organizations to get the certification and testing necessary. And especially since New York City has indicated uh, the protocol for September 20th to go into effect, um, people are scrambling right now to get the mandatory certifications. I don't have the exact number, but I, I will say it's it's definitely noticed the difference, yeah. Do you have a sense of why there was a lag? I think in the CR article, there was an indication that potentially cost, testing costs was what was um, prohibiting or stop impeding people from uh, pursuing this. It's interesting back in 2020, um, UL 2849 was being pushed by our industry. Um, and then the bike boom happened and all these brands came to market. And I think things just fell apart. It, maybe money had a lot to do with it. I hate that. Um, it's very unfortunate, you know. And for your database, that's a self-reporting, so there's no sort of confirmation that some a, a company just asserts. Correct. It is self-reporting. We do ask for copies of their certifications, okay. and we do review those. We also ask for copies of their insurance, and we do review those. But it is self-reporting, and, and it's optional. Thank you. Go ahead. I just want to make a comment on the, the reporting of the certificates. Uh, you know, certification agencies like CSA Group, UL, are required to have online databases that uh, explicitly note who is certified to what standards. So that information is, is public uh, no matter what NRTL, which is mandated by OSHA, uh, is certifies to these standards. You can go on their websites and, and find that information publicly to verify if, if a manufacturer says they're certified. You can go on an NRTL's website and confirm that. When you say you, is that a cons how how accessible is that? Is that uh, something a, a consumer could yes. easily access? It's on yeah, it's it's okay. on an online. You don't have even need to create a um, a login in some instances. It's free access, so you can go on either UL's website, CSAs, and there's other NRTLs as well. Okay, and any consumer can verify that. Thank you. That's helpful, um, Ms. Knight. I I did want to just return to you for a moment. Um, uh, and you talked about the impact of noncompliance with uh, with industry standard, standards is leaving lower income users at a greater risk uh, uh, as opposed to those who could afford more high end bicycles. Can you elaborate a little bit more on why you think mandatory standards specifically will help that population? 
Yes, thank you for the question. Um, standards that apply across the marketplace are needed because at the current uh, current situation, the way it is, uh, more expensive bikes are more likely to be UL certified, and unfortunately, um, less expensive bikes are not. And of course, when uh, you depend on uh, e-bike for your livelihood and you're not making a lot of money, you're going to get what you can afford. And if what you can afford isn't UL certified, then you know you're going to pay the ultimate price in worst case scenario. Um, that obviously shouldn't be the case. Consumers expect that what they're buying has been tested for safety, um, and they should be right about that. So all manufacturers across the board, it's um, it's their duty really, and the duty of distributors and sellers to make sure that there is a baseline of safety that is being met. And uh, right now, just going off the commission's letter, the minimum for that is the are the UL standards that are available. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any additional questions. Mr. Chair, again, thank you to all of you for coming today. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. Um, the risk of keeping us here longer, I was just going to have a few closing thoughts, which I would use as a second round if anybody else wanted to have some closing thoughts. Um, really, I just want to take a minute to reflect on what I've heard today and that all the panelists have provided useful information, raised important issues, and shed lights on paths each of us can and should be taking to improve the safety of lithium ion batteries and with respect to the current crisis facing us with the deadly fires coming from e-bikes and scooters you know there are a few takeaways that jumped out at me you know first the voluntary standards on the books today set a good foundation that manufacturers should be following right now but they're not perfect CPSC has written to UL to look to ways to improve it and has been working to strengthen them. And I think that needs to continue and continue at a faster pace. And second, the voluntary standards aren't enough. Everybody has come, uh, or most everybody has come to testify before us, has expressed support for mandatory standards for the batteries and electrical systems and the e-bike or e-mobility devices. And such a standard would definitely make things easier for CPSC to engage in enforcement and provide a baseline safety um, for consumers out there. Yeah, unfortunately, as many of you are aware, developing mandatory standards under CPSC standard uh, statute can be burdensome and slow. And you know, for that reason, I am grateful for the engagement by you know Congress and supportive of legislation that would streamline that process and strengthen our authority and able to move forward uh, to be able to establish these mandatory standards. So I, I thank Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand and Representative Torres for their participation today and stand ready to work with them. You know, third, I would say all of us need to act now to protect consumers. Here at the CPSC, you know, we'll work with stakeholders to strengthen the standards for e-bikes and, and scooters, including aftermarket uh, batteries and chargers, and monitor the, the, work, uh, the marketplace for defective products to prevent these fires from happening in the first place. But the first line of defense really needs to be the micromobility device and battery manufacturers and importers, as well as the retailers and the online marketplaces that are selling these products. The manufacturers and importers need to step up and bring to the market e, you know, e-scooters, batteries, chargers that comply with the standards that are out there now. Given the hazard, there's no excuse for not meeting those standards today. And retailers and online marketplaces should protect their consumers by requiring that any products they're selling or offering to sell on their, their sites that meet these same standards and have systems in place to make sure that they are monitoring the products on their sites so that they can identify when those aren't being met and take steps to get those off. And all of industry should be vigilant and you know cease to work with suppliers and sellers who are skirting safety standards. You know, honestly, these practices should be in place for, for all products. Um, but given the you know, particular uh, risks that we're seeing with micromobility devices, you know, want to pay special attention for that here today. So um, those are just some thoughts wrapping up. I don't know if any of the other commissioners, Mr. Feldman, if you have any other thoughts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, just in conclusion, I do want to thank everybody that showed up on this panel and to our two previous panels, uh, the the expertise and um, uh, work that that all you do day in day out, the attention that you paid uh, certainly supplements everything that that we're seeing here at the agency, and it's invaluable to our decision making process. Mr. Chairman, 
Uh, this is a, uh, a form that we've been asking for for a while. I, I'm glad that we were able to work together to get this scheduled. Uh, the hard work of your staff getting uh, all of the, the blocking and tackling to make this possible. It's been a long day, but uh, but I, th I think we're left as an agency with a, a, a wealth of testimony and information um, that's going to help guide our future decision making. So thank you and thank all of you. Mr. Trump, you got any more questions or thoughts? Well, we've heard today that Lithium ion batteries are now a leading cause of fatal fires in New York City, and it's a matter of time before the problem reaches other places in the U.S. at that same critical level. And if that's not a wake up call, if, we, if we've been waiting for one and, and that's not it, I don't know what would be. So I think we all agree we need to solve this and we need to solve it now. Americans can make all the right decisions to keep their families safe, but with this issue, that's not enough. You know, they could be at risk because their downstairs neighbors charging a bike they've never seen. And we're forcing people to live with that fear because we haven't solved this issue yet. We need to. And to those listening, make sure we do it quickly. Please hold us accountable. Today is an incredibly encouraging step towards that end. You know, it's not lost on me that this broad group of experts, you know, including industry and voluntary standards bodies are all calling on us to, to implement a mandatory standard. That is not lost. It's not common. Uh, and, and I appreciate the sentiment. And I hear you loud and clear on that one. I'm also encouraged by um, the, the welcomeness and agreement on the need to consider things like check battery lights, safety shutoffs in both the battery and the charger, a focus on state of health, uh, VIN numbers potentially for identification purposes, and making cells inaccessible to consumers uh, and making tamper evident. I know that we're all here because we want people to have both protection and peace of mind. So I thank you all for your tremendous contributions and getting us there today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ball, any questions or comments? Thank, uh, no, uh, just a couple of closing comments. Again, to thank you to this panel and to the witnesses from the previous panel. And thank you, to Mr. Chair, for um, putting this meeting together with all of our staffs. And special thanks to Anna Layton uh, for all of her work in putting this together. It was, uh, I know she took the laboring oar, and I do really appreciate that. I think hearing from the stakeholders is an incredibly important part of the regulatory process, and I think today's hearing provided really useful and helpful information. Uh, I feel encouraged, like my colleagues, that there is broad consensus that we need to act and that we need to act quickly. I know sometimes we move uh, at a glacial pace, uh, and it's my hope that the consensus I heard today uh, will lay the foundation for us to move quickly. So I'm committed to moving quickly, and it sounds like uh, I'm hearing that across the board. So I'm very encouraged by that, and thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And thanks again to all the participants in today's forum. It's been a long day and I appreciate you being here and sharing your experience with us. I do wanna thank the staff who helped put this together, including the facil facilities team, the Office of the Secretary, the Office of Communications, who assist getting everything organized. Uh, I, I will join my fellow commissioners and do a special shout out for my Deputy Chief of Staff, Anna Layton, who was central in organizing um, today's forum. And finally, thanks to the CPSC staff, investigators, engineers, and attorneys who are working on these issues every day. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.